by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, at the end of the day, um, there will be a brief opportunity for public comment, but most importantly, we want everyone to know that there is a time period blocked off for public comment for tomorrow, starting at 4.30 on both the Blue Cross and the MVP filings. Um, for the purposes of today's hearing, I'm going to designate Michael Barber, the general counsel for the board, as the hearing officer. And um, with that, uh, Mike, I'm going to hand over the meeting to you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Michael Barber. I've been appointed by the chair to serve as the hearing officer for today's hearing. Um, as the chair said, the purpose of this hearing is to uh, to take evidence and argument on Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont's 2021 individual and small group rate filing. The docket for this case is GMCB-005-20 RR. Uh, the Green Mountain Care Board has jurisdiction over this matter pursuant to Title 18 of the Vermont Statutes Annotated, Section 9375-B6, as well as Title 8 of the Vermont Statutes, Section 4062, Subsection A. Representing Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont today are Bridget A.C. and Mike D'Onofrio of the law firm Stress and Mayor LLP. Representing the Healthcare Office of the Healthcare Advocate, excuse me, are Jay Angoff, Kylie Kuiper, and Eric Schulteis. I also want to recognize the board's general counsel, uh, associate general counsel, excuse me, Amran Abergeli, who will be conducting the uh, direct examination of the board's actuaries, um, as well as Gavin Boyles, I'm not sure he's on, but um, the general counsel for Department of Financial Regulation. Um, I am. Uh, great. Hi, Gavin. Because we are holding the hearing remotely, before I go any further, I just wanted to um, check and make sure all the attorneys and all the board members um, can hear okay and can be heard. So I'm going to call on each of you. If you could just take yourself off mute and let me know if you can hear okay, that'd be great. So, Mr. Chair? Here. Board Member Holmes? Yes. Board Member Lunge? Yes. Board Member Yusufer? Yes. Board Member Pelham? Yes. Amron? Yes. Ms. Acey? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Mr. D'Onofrio? Yes, thank you. I can hear and I can see you all. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Kuiper? Kylie, if, if you're speaking, you're on mute. She was having some issues with the call in. Okay. Um, can so you hear me now? Her... Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Hey, Eric, I can hear you. And Sunny, can you hear okay? Yes, good morning. Can you hear me okay? I can, thanks. Okay, I'm going to keep myself muted, but if I have any trouble hearing, I will unmute and give a wave and let you know, but thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, as we discussed, if at any point you get dropped from the call today, you have my cell phone number. Please just text me and we'll take a pause while you get back on. We are recording today's proceedings. Uh, we also have a court reporter here to transcribe the proceedings. Um, and we will provide the parties with a copy of the transcript as soon as we receive it. It looks like we have 53 people in attendance this, this morning. Um, if we were holding the Hearing in person, we would have a sign-in sheet outside the room. Obviously, we can't do that here. Um, you know, since this is a full day long hearing, people are going to be coming and going. So I'm kind of thinking of skipping the kind of roll call of phone numbers that the board typically does in regular board meetings. Um, but does any party have a objection to that? No objection. HCA. 
No objection. No, I don't. Okay, thanks. Uh, for members of the public who are present, as the chair said, we will be taking public comment at the close of the proceedings. However, um, I can't say when we will be able to get to that portion of the meeting. So if you don't want to sit through um, what's sure to be several hours of testimony, we're going to have a meeting tomorrow afternoon from 4.30 to 6.30 in the afternoon that will be dedicated exclusively to hearing from the public on this filing and the other individual and small group filing uh, from MVP. Information about that meeting and, and how to participate can be found by going to the Green Mountain Care Board's website and clicking on the rate review tab. Additionally, you can submit written comments to the board via our website and by regular mail. And the board will be taking comments through July 23rd on this filing. Uh, for members of the public who are present, I'd ask that you check your microphones at this point and make sure you're muted. Um, also, for those of you participating uh, or, or watching on the computer, please do not use the chat function of Microsoft Teams. Uh, that will be very distracting for, for all the participants. Um, and if you want to comment, uh, please use one of the avenues that I mentioned previously. Before we begin, I want to remind the board and the parties to exercise caution regarding information that has been marked confidential, as these matters can't be discussed in a public setting. The parties have marked documents that contain confidential materials as confidential in the hearing binders. And if it's all right with you, Ms. AC or Mr. D'Onofrio, um, if you could just describe how the confidential materials are designated in the binders because it differs uh, between the carriers and the hearings. Um, so I think it would just be helpful to explain how that was done. Sure. Um, so uh, we've only provided in the binders the full unredacted copies of exhibits. Each exhibit that has some confidential information in it is marked as confidential, I believe, both on the document and in the table of contents. And then the material within the document that was redacted for confidentiality purposes is highlighted in the document. Okay, thank you. So if it becomes necessary to discuss confidential materials in the binders, we'll need to go into an executive session. Uh, we have a separate phone line for that purpose, should we need it. Um, so Mr. D'Onofrio, or sorry, Ms. AC and Mr. Angoff, uh, the board received exhibit binders on July 15th with 21 bait stamped exhibits. Uh, after receiving the binders, we received a response to board questions regarding um, pension losses, which was marked Exhibit 22, as well as a chart marked Exhibit 23, um, and then an exhibit from the HCA marked Exhibit 24. I just want to check and make sure everyone who needs those, everyone who has a binder, has those documents. Does, it, does anyone not have those documents? Okay, hearing nothing, I'll move on. Um, so I understand that the parties have stipulated to the admission of all of those documents. Um, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. This is Jay Angoff. Okay. I see you nodding your head, Bridget. Yes, that's right. Okay. Okay. Um, I also understand that the parties have stipulated to the admissibility of um, the HCA exhibits, which are not uh, included in the briefs. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, then at this point, I'm going to admit all of these documents into evidence uh, with the exception of Exhibit 22. Um, sorry, Exhibit 23, the, the graph. Um, I understand it. It's a, 
a chart showing calculations from data published by the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, and the HCA has stipulated to its admissibility, but um, I feel like I need a factual foundation for uh, for that before I admit it. So um, I understand that can be provided through Mr. Schultz. Yes, uh, that's correct, Mr. Barber. That'll take place during Mr. Schultz's direct testimony. Thanks. Okay, then I'll entertain a motion to admit this document um, after most Mr. Schultz has established a factual foundation for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, in years past, we have sworn in the witnesses all at once at the beginning of the hearing. Um, because we're doing this remotely and I can't see everyone, um, I figure we just do that as the witnesses are called. Um, so at this point, does either party have anything to discuss before we move to opening statements? Not for the HCA. Uh, I have nothing for the board unless Mr. D'Onofrio has something, uh, nothing for um, Blue Cross unless Mr. D'Onofrio has something. Nope, nothing further. Okay, and Ms. Acey, uh, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, thank you, Mr. Barber. Good morning, Chair Mullen and members of the board. In some ways, this day will be pretty similar to last year's rate hearing in July of 2019. The board members, uh, the lawyers, and many of the witnesses will be the same. And likewise, the core of Blue Cross's presentation, um, the actuarial analysis that supports the proposed rates will be similar. But the fact that we are in this virtual meeting not at the state house is only the most obvious sign that the world is a very different place than it was a year ago. The pandemic has affected all of our lives, the healthcare system, and the economy. It's tempting to say that uh, sitting in the hearing room last year, no one could have imagined this. But I went back and looked, um, and in fact, at least three times during the hearing last year, witnesses pointed out the risk of an outbreak, an epidemic, or a pandemic. Uh, both Blue Cross and Commissioner Pichak testified that Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's solvency is critical to its ability to pay claims regardless of un unexpected events, including an epidemic. Solvency and financial sustainability are long-term propositions. For an insurer, by definition, that means planning for the unexpected. For Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, that means maintaining adequate reserves and requesting rates that are sufficient to cover the cost of providing health care to our members. Today, through testimony from Dr. Kate McIntosh, Paul Schultz, Ruth Green, and Andrew Garland, the board will hear three main themes. First, and most critically, that the rate is actuarially supported. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has chosen not to dispute LNE's utilization trend. That means there is no dispute on this point. A rate increase of 5.5% is necessary given what it costs to provide health care to our members. The board's actuary agrees that the assumptions for administrative costs and contribution to reserves are reasonable and its analysis shows that these requests are modest when compared to other similar plans. Healthcare costs are continuing to rise. Mr. Schultz will discuss some of the primary drivers of these increases in his testimony, and Dr. McIntosh will provide clinical context um, for one of those drivers, specialty pharmaceuticals. The board has asked questions uh, prior to this hearing about Blue Cross's pension, recent pension loss. For today, I think the key point is that not one penny in these rates is based on the pension loss. What else is not in these rates? There's no accounting for any increased costs in 2021 due to the pandemic, even though we fully expect that there will be increased costs for things like deferred care, treatment, and a vaccine. The requested increase from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is lower than that of its competitor. The second theme that the board will hear is that both before and during the pandemic, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has been has remained a leader and a partner in Vermont's healthcare reform efforts and the healthcare system. 
Dr. McIntosh will discuss our rapid response to the pandemic and the steps taken to support providers, protect public health, and keep members covered. She'll also discuss examples of value-based programs that are helping to improve the quality of care. Mr. Garland will discuss how Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont worked with the Accountable Care Organization to adapt to the pandemic. Ms. Green will explain why adequate reserves have been crucial to these efforts. Blue Cross has been able to target resources where they are needed most, helping people stay covered, assisting providers, and adapting policies to meet immediate needs. The third theme that the board will hear is that as we face another year of substantial uncertainty, including real uncertainty about future impacts of the pandemic in Vermont, protecting Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont solvency is more critical than ever. I want to repeat something that Commissioner Pichak said in his testimony last year. An independent and financially sustainable Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is good for consumers because it certainly can pay its medical claims regardless of the economic conditions that it might confront in upcoming years. It can pay the medical claims regardless of unexpected events that might occur due to illness, outbreak, other extreme conditions. And a financially sustainable Blue Cross Blue Shield will also have the capital it needs to invest in programs and people and in technologies that will improve the consumer experience and more importantly, improve consumer outcomes as well. Every word of what the commissioner said last year remains accurate and even more important today. This pandemic is far from over and we don't know how it will play out in Vermont. The actuarial team at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has worked tirelessly to try and model potential impacts of the pandemic. That modeling, which we've shared with the board, shows a range of potential results. As Mr. Schultz will discuss in more detail for claims cost, based on the best information we have, the pandemic is likely to have an impact on claims costs that ranges from modestly favorable to substantially unfavorable. Overall, with respect to claims costs, the majority of outcomes are relatively neutral. But in terms of planning for uncertainty, the likelihood of what some call a windfall for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is vanishingly small. In contrast, it is not hard to construct an outcome in which Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has to pay substantially higher claims. The proposed rates don't include additional claims costs related to the pandemic. We have consistently that part of the function of reserves is to absorb those kinds of unexpected costs. It's important to understand, as Mr. Schultz will explain further, that funding these pandemic-related costs through reserves is no different from providing a rate discount or a rebate. But it's critical, however, that the proposed rates be fully funded so that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has adequate reserves to meet these needs. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Stacy. Uh, Mr. Angoff, do you have an opening statement? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer and Mr. Chair and members of the board. First thing I'd like to do is to express my admiration for the board and the government of Vermont and the people of Vermont for what a great job they have done in containing the coronavirus. This is an underreported story nationally. Vermont obviously has a lot of natural advantages when it comes to containing the coronavirus. It's got a small population. It's got a sparse population. But so it makes no sense to, to compare Vermont to New York or Boston or Albany. But even compared to other small, spar sparsely populated states, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont has done by far the best job, by far the best job in containing the coronavirus. That comes at a cost. Obviously, there's been tremendous sacrifice by Vermonters. There's terrible unemployment. The economy has been devastated, but it has saved lives. There are a few companies, though, that have benefited because of the sacrifice and the suffering 
of Vermonters. And what is Blue Cross? Blue Cross did not cause the coronavirus pandemic, but Blue Cross is benefiting enormously by the coronavirus pandemic. It's benefiting in two ways. First, it's benefiting because there has been so little coronavirus in Vermont because the costs to Blue Cross of the coronavirus have been so nominal. And second, it's also benefiting because people at great sacrifice have avoided going to the doctor, avoiding going to the hospital. So Blue Cross's traditional costs just aren't there. So bizarrely, perversely, although Vermonters have suffered, Blue Cross has benefited enormously. That's the first thing I'd like the board to keep in mind as you hear Blue Cross once again ask for more money. The second thing that I'd ask the board to keep in mind is Blue Cross is also the recipient of enormous windfalls over the past couple of years. You remember last year, there was a little bit of discussion about, well, were they really going to get all this money that the Trump tax law authorized in 2019 or 2020? And they said, well, no, we may not get it in 2019. We may not get it in 2020. Well, they not only have they gotten what was due them in 2019 and 2020, but a new law was passed to accelerate the refundable tax credits under the Trump tax bill so, so that Blue Cross in 2020 is guaranteed to get almost $40 million because of the Trump's tax act. In addition, Blue Cross has more money coming to it, about $15 million, based on the Supreme Court's recent decision in, uh, in the risk card and litigation, and the Court of Claims decision in the cost sharing litigation. So that's additional money that Blue Cross has coming to it. There's no uncertainty about that. So that's the second thing I'd like the board to keep in mind as you hear Blue Cross ask for more money once again is that they've gotten an enormous amount of money over the past couple of years from other sources. The third thing though that I'd like to keep in the board to keep in mind is the most important. And that is the $40 million that Blue Cross threw away, the $40 million that their policyholders had paid and that this board has authorized, has authorized, has authorized in the past. Blue Cross took $40 million and burned it up. It went down the drain. That is worth 180 points of RBC ratio. What that means is, obviously, look, today Blue Cross has so much money, it's not a problem. Blue Cross. Uh, does not deserve an increase. Without this 180 million drop, they would deserve a decrease. With the 180 million drop, it's probably close to break even. But how can a company, you'll hear Paul, Paul Schultz talk about how Blue Cross is the steward of our policyholders' premiums and our reserves. You just heard Ms. Ace talk about the importance of maintaining adequate reserves. Well, what Blue Cross, the stewards of their policyholder reserves did, is make a foolish, reckless investment, invest money not in bonds, not in stocks, but in some very high-flying hedge fund, volatility hedge fund vehicle, which resulted in a $40 million loss in one month. So that's the third, and it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking, Mr. Chairman, because but for this loss, policyholders of Vermont would be getting a decrease this year. So that's the third thing I'd like, to, like you to keep in mind, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. And just, I'd like to close by saying once again, how I admire the board and the government of Vermont and the people of Vermont for how much they've sacrificed in order to contain the, the coronavirus. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Angoff. Ms. AC. Mr. Nafrio, please call your first witness. Blue Cross calls Dr. Kate McIntosh. Can you hear me okay? 
Yes, I can. I Are you able to? I can't see your video for some reason. You may have to pin it to your desktop. Yeah, just one second while I do that. There you are. Now I can see you. Hi. Kevin, you're on mute. Kevin, did you have something to say? All I was saying, uh, uh, Mike, was that you were probably going to have to allow a few seconds for each witness so that we can pin them. Um, we're going to have to unpin them when they're finished, probably, to make room for the additional uh, faces that we pin. So, and I was letting you know that it did indeed work when once you pin, once we pinned her. So, <laughs> it's a good time to ask all the board members. Can you see Miss McIntosh? Anyone can't see Ms. McIntosh. Hearing none, Ms. McIntosh, are you uh, prepared to take the oath? Yes. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Ms. Acey, the witness is yours. Good morning, Dr. McIntosh. Would you please state your full name for the record? My name is Kate McIntosh. Mm -hmm. What is your position with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont? I am the Senior Medical Director and the Director of Quality for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Would you please take a look at Exhibit 13 in your binder? Yes. Is Exhibit 13 your pre-filed testimony in this matter? Yes, it is. Do you affirm that it is true and correct to the best of your knowledge? I do. Dr. McIntosh, would you please briefly describe your clinical and practice background for the board? So I am a board certified pediatrician. I had 22 years of clinical practice experience before I came to Blue Cross. I ran a private practice in Middlebury for 16 of those years, and I was the chair of pediatrics at Porter Hospital. Dr. McIntosh, you provided some statistics regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in your pre-filed testimony. I'm going to ask you to update some of those numbers. Uh, you indicated that in June, the number of new infections per day in Vermont averaged between seven and eight. What has been the experience so far in July? For the first two weeks of July, the average number of new infections per day remained between seven and eight, and the range reported by the Vermont Department of Health was between two and 17. And these numbers do not reflect any, um, any of the uh, goings on down in Manchester, which are still under debate. So the average range was between two and 17 per day. In your pre-filed testimony, you also gave some information regarding the spread of COVID-19 nationwide. What, if anything, has changed since your pre-filed testimony was submitted? So since my pre-filed testimony was submitted, we've continued to see uh, significant surges of COVID-19 in the states, in the West and the South. Uh, the number of states seeing a rise in new infections, however, is beginning to spread throughout the country and is not limited just to the states that are seeing surges. Uh, the rate of new infections per day is currently hitting approximately between 60 and 70,000 new cases per day within the country, but we have seen some surges as high as 77 percent as well. Um, I we don't expect these numbers to change at this point unless they are going to increase. And the general census, consensus of uh, Dr. Fauci and some of the other physicians up at the level of the NIH is that we are still within the first wave of this virus, that this is not the second wave, this is a continuation of the first wave, and we haven't even begun to see the end of this thing. You described in your pre-filed testimony that uh, your opinion that the course of the pandemic in Vermont is unpredictable. Would you please briefly describe, uh, would you please briefly summarize your opinion on that issue? Vermont is not an island. Unlike New Zealand or Australia, we cannot close our borders and allow Vermont to simply exist, coexist by itself. What's happening in the rest of the country is going to affect us. 
And circumstances can change very quickly if there's an outbreak. The virus spreads particularly easily. And one of the things that is the most uh, concerning about this virus is that it spreads often by asymptomatic spread. And there is new evidence coming out just within this last week to suggest that asymptomatic carriers may be some of the primary uh, spreaders of, in super spreader events. The other problem is that nothing has fundamentally changed about this virus since March. We still do not have particularly effective treatments. We have no way of preventing it except through public health measures. And it, even though, you know, I think that we as a country are beginning to lose interest in the virus, the virus is still present and is still a real and present concern. So fall and winter are a real concern because although the virus spreads less outdoors, it does spread more easily indoors and in confined spaces. So as the cold weather returns, the virus will spread more easily. As schools and colleges reopen, there is a concern that we will see more spread because you have larger numbers of people in, uh, close, in close and confined spaces. Uh, Dr. McIntosh, what has been your role in Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's response to the pandemic? So I've played a lead role in the pandemic response, including the responses toward providers, toward, toward um, patients, toward stakeholders, and then, you know, internal policy work as well. In your pre-filed testimony, you provide details about that response. Would you please briefly summarize for the board what Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has been doing during this unprecedented time? So Vermont has been a, a real success story so far. Um, we worked very fast as a state and also as a company. I think that the governor deserves kudos for the rapidity with which he um, shut down the businesses initially in March. And I also think that because of our demographics, we, we were fortunate and we were way ahead of the rest of the country. Um, I started watching this pandemic in January when it first started as it, and then through February as it marched its way across the world. And we became concerned pretty early on that this was going to have a major impact on our own company as well as on our, our members. And our goal was to keep um, our members safe and to keep our, our company functioning. So I don't want to repeat all of the um, details of what we did to connect with stakeholders and regulators and to, to keep everything moving, but I want to explain how we targeted our resources to areas that were of particular concern. So the first concern uh, was we wanted to make sure that providers could still care for their patients. I ran a practice. I know firsthand what the impact of this is to these practices. And so my, my first question when all of this started was, how do we help to keep these practices open? I knew what the challenges were gonna be. And so one of the things that we did was I recommended to DFR that they join us in promoting telephone care as a um, part of, as an extension of uh, audiovisual telemedicine during this emergency so that patients could get the care that they needed and so that providers would be able to keep their doors open, especially these small independent practices uh, who are, were clearly going to struggle as a result of the, of the pandemic and don't have as, as deep a financial bench to be able to support themselves. We took many steps in this area to support virtual appointments, making it easier for people to get prescriptions filled, to change the policies virtually overnight so that we could remove barriers to care. Our second thing was that we wanted to make sure we could keep people safe. So we worked with DFR to ensure that people with symptoms could get evaluated without any concern for co-payments or for cost share associated with their emergency room visits or their office visits or their urgent care visits. And we wanted to also approve we approved all transportations of COVID positive patients because we wanted to keep family members safe. We wanted patients discharged from the hospital to be able to come home and not expose their family members on the trip home if they needed to continue to be isolated. We also wanted to support the system as we prepared for what was and is still very unknown. So we suspended prior authorization requirements for hospitals so that they could move patients around within between nursing homes and hospitals and between uh, different types of facilities to prepare for any kind of a surge that might come. 
And we also wanted to keep people covered. It's incredibly important. Um, and we recognize that Vermonters were having difficulty with payments. So we offered flexibility and we have not to date canceled a single QHP member for non-payment. Thank you. Dr. McIntosh, are you generally familiar with the proposed rate that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is requesting in this proceeding? Yes. And understanding that uh, Mr. Schultz will address the actuarial basis for the rate in detail. Uh, to your knowledge, are increasing drug costs part of the reason for the rate increase? Yes. Um, I know that there are certain categories of specialty drugs that are definitely cost drivers. Are you able to provide some concrete examples to illustrate this point for the board? Uh, yes, there are many, but I'll take one in particular. So melanoma treatment is an excellent example. Melanoma used to be a death sentence. And in fact, when I was a resident, I had a colleague who died very young from melanoma. So I know this personally. The amazing new treatments for melanoma have made melanoma essentially a chronic condition. This is a miracle drug, and there are many of these out there for all kinds of other treatments. They extend life, they preserve life, but they are extremely expensive. And because of their nature as a biological agent, they don't come out as generic. So they are they are they remain expensive. There are many new oral chemotherapy treatments, for example, on the market that have become available for cancers that never previously had uh, treatments. And this is very exciting, but it is also a real driver of our, of our overall cost. The other thing that has come over the horizon are the new treatments for gene therapies, which are some of the most expensive drugs out there. Actually, they are the most expensive drugs out there. The first gene therapy has come onto the market. It is a treatment for a condition called spinal muscular atrophy. It costs $2.1 million for a dose of this medication. There are approximately 600 additional gene therapies in the pipeline, almost all of which are likely to be priced somewhere between a half a million dollars and $2 million per dose. So these are life-saving treatments, which is good news, but the cost of these drugs raise very complex policy issues. And as you know, these are often discussed in other forums. But for our purposes, the costs are real, they're steadily increasing, and we do have to account for them in the rates. And Dr. McIntosh, um, are you familiar with programs that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is implementing to reduce the cost of health care while maintaining the quality of care? Yes, that's part of my work as the Director of Quality. So as the Director of Quality, my focus is on value. And value is the intersection of cost and quality. So a high cost product may produce a high quality result and the value may be appropriate or a high cost product may not produce a high quality result. And we would consider that to be low value care. So one of the challenges and the things that we are really working to do is to remove low value care from the market. And by doing this, we're trying to align the cost of a service and the quality of it so that we can get a sense of where those areas of high value care are and where those areas of low value care are. Is there an example of a value-based product change that you could describe in more detail for the board? Yes, so our new laboratory benefit manager called Avalon is a good example of this, of this approach. Avalon takes a, an approach to laboratories that addresses that uh, that looks for what are high value tests that are being done and what are low value tests that are being done and they use their medical policies which are beautifully written by the way to distribute care as what is high value for a chronic condition and what is low value for a chronic condition so for example it is important for all adults to have a cholesterol level checked at least one it, possibly once a year, but it isn't necessary to have a cholesterol level checked six times a year. And the, the wonderful thing about Avalon is they promote this high quality care with no impact on the providers. So the providers are not forced to go through prior authorization or any process like this, but at the same time, Avalon is promoting this much more revolutionary uh, approach to high value care. 
in the past, our lab reimbursement was pegged to Medicare, and it was a good system. But bringing in a partner with this expertise in lab value is an even better approach. And we're trying to move beyond where the industry is right now in fee for service into this high value model. And we've already seen better outcomes with Avalon, and those savings are reflected in the proposed rates. With respect to the proposed rates, another element of the rates is administrative costs. And again, understanding that you're not an actuary, is it your understanding that programs to improve quality may have administrative costs to implement? Yes, they do. The tradition from fee-for-service to value requires both um, initiatives and those and the cost of implementing those initi initiatives. As we struggle to balance our need to keep costs low, um, while simultaneously developing these new programs and these initiatives um, to improve the value of healthcare overall, there is a cost to trying to move to value. Is there an example of a program you could describe to the board where, in your view, the cost of the program is justified by the outcome? Yes, a good example of this program is our provider passport program for radiology. So we designed this program to reduce the burden on the providers while simultaneously prompting best practices. So what we did was there are certain types of specialists who order a lot of tests. And if they order a lot of high cost radiology tests, they can qualify for this program. Overall, if their referral rate of these tests is within best practices with a variance of only 2%. So in other words, if 98% of the tests that they order are within best practices for these high volume, these high, high cost tests, then we have removed their need of, for prior authorization. Now we know that we will see perhaps a slight increase because those 2% of their tests that are not within best practices are still going to go through, but we feel as though the value there is greater then the, the value is greater than, than the risk of that increased cost because we're getting high quality and lower burden on the providers. We also have a second track where if you have a, about a 95% track record of best practices, then we waive PA, but we do education to try to explain to the individual provider why it is that the 5% of tests that they're ordering again, are not necessarily best practice. And we're hoping that with that, we will see them move into the 98% range. So what we're doing is we are accruing a little bit of extra cost from the tests that might not be necessary, but we are substantially decreasing provider burden for these providers who are demonstrating that they can come into line with best practices. And providers can move in and out of this program depending on what their track record is. But the, the monitoring, the education, the continuing education, and the development of these programs all um, come into the administrative cost. But we feel that the, that the value of this program to decreasing burden and promoting the quality of care, overall quality of care is worth it. Thank you. To, to shift gears uh, briefly back to the pandemic, um, Dr. McIntosh, did you work with Mr. Schultz and the act actuarial team on modeling potential financial impacts related to COVID-19 on Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont? Yes, I did. Would you, <clears throat> would you please briefly describe the role you played in that process? Yes. So I reviewed 33 categories of care, and we assessed whether those specific types of care and the developed and whether we thought that they were likely to be deferred care or care that had simply disappeared out of the system. So with each of these categories, we developed assumptions for the return of care for that service category. So overall, we estimated that 56.1% of services that were deferred during the slowdown would be made up. And I also assisted in then also developing um, assumptions about changes in demand for certain claim areas that we're likely to see differently in the future as a result of the pandemic. Have you read the Oliver Wyman report that was submitted by the Department of Financial Regulation? Yes, I have. So I want to direct you to Exhibit 10 and specifically uh, page 7 of Exhibit 10. Yes. Is that the Oliver Wyman report? Yes. Is there any part of that report that you would like to respond to? 
Yes. So Oliver Wyman suggested that our model was conservative, meaning that our estimates for the return of deferred care were too high. I think that they particularly suggested that it, that our estimations of 100% in some categories were too high. And I have a couple of responses to that. So first, we quickly realized when we started to do the math that minor changes like 100%, 95%, or even 90% had really very little impact on the model. Um, so with some categories of care, it's very likely that the return is going to be 100%. And in our model, it's also in some areas of care, the, we calculate the return as being zero. Now, maybe some of those zeros are gonna turn out to be twos or threes or 5%. And maybe some of the 100s are gonna be 95% or 92%. But that level of difference doesn't change the outcome enough to matter. So second of all, I think that Oliver Wyman may have been thinking about a shorter time frame than we were. So we were asking the question, how many of these claims are going to return over the next two to three years? So for example, if your knee is scheduled to be replaced, if you're scheduled for a knee replacement and then the pandemic intervened, sure, you might postpone that surgery for a few months, but the fundamental reality is your knee still hurts every time you walk. And at some point, that her pain is going to become frustrating enough that you are going to go in and you're going to have that surgery done. So that is part of our anticipation that we are going to see this catch up because many of the things that we saw deferral on are the kinds of things like chemotherapy, for example, that are not simply going to go away. If you, if you deferred your chemotherapy, you're still going to get your, total, your complete course of chemotherapy. If you deferred your knee replacement, you still need a new knee. Um, and third, what we're seeing in June is that care did come back. And frankly, I was actually surprised at how high the care returned to things like the emergency room. I thought that we were gonna see a prolonged uh, session of inhibition where people were gonna be afraid to go to the emergency room. But in fact, the ER has come back above benchmark and office visits are coming back strongly as well. We've also seen a surge in mental health claims as a result probably of the pandemic and of the stress that people are under. And then finally, we know that Vermont hospitals and providers are strongly encouraging people to come back and they're adding hours on the weekends and even and after you know, traditional office hours to accommodate that higher demand for those deferred procedures. If Vermont experiences an increase in COVID infections above current levels, um, would you expect a similar slowdown in claims as we saw in the spring of 2020? Generally, no. Um, hospitals across the country are working very hard to figure out how to care for COVID and non-COVID patients at the same time. And hospitals are highly motivated to get their service lines up and running again, despite a kind of baseline level of COVID that's going on in the background. So I think it's going to take a lot more than the the sort of lower level, the, the levels that we saw in March and April to prompt the kind of shutdown that happened in March. I think we're much more likely to see an ongoing combination of regular ongoing care and then sort of bursts of COVID that are getting treated also separately um, in the same institution that's figured out how to split their care. Thank you. Um, I think that's all I have for now. If I could just have a minute to go over my notes. Thank you. I have, I have no further questions at this time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Angoff, do you have questions for Dr. McIntosh? Yes, I do. Good morning, Dr. McIntosh. Um, you said that nationally uh, there are six, between 60 and 70,000 cases being reported today of the coronavirus. Is that right? That's new cases per day, yes. Right. But in, in Vermont, though, it's between 19 down to, what did you say, the range was between 19 and 4 or 19 and 2? Uh, 2 to 17. Two, right 2 to now. 17. Okay. okay. So what, what do you attribute? the you know enormous difference between what's happening nationally and what's happening in Vermont. 
What, what do you attribute that to? So I think there are a variety of reasons that we're seeing that difference between Vermont and the rest of the country. Um, the first is that I think we can give credit to the, um, to the governor that we shut down early and hard. And if you listened to his uh, report, his, his presentation on Friday, he also refers to that the opening up back up of Vermont has been conservative and that we're falling, we're less conservative than the European countries, but more conservative than a lot of the country. And so we're staying in this conservative place. Um, and that's part of why we've managed to not see uh, an, an, a, spar a, a stark increase in cases. But I also think that it's important to remember that we have also been lucky and we cannot underestimate that. One of the things that I would um, point you to is in my pre-filed testimony, I refer to South Korea. South Korea looked a lot like we look now. They, they had the pandemic under control, and then they had an unexpected super spreader event that launched them into an out of control wave. So it doesn't take much. It only takes one individual who may not even know they have symptoms in a large gathering to have a super spreader event to change these numbers. I don't want that to happen. I would like to stay where we're at right now, but we cannot take it for granted. And so you said the governor deserves credit. I'm sure he does. What about the people of Vermont? Have the people of Vermont done anything differently than people in other states? Not really. Um, I think that there was, I think that we have, I think that the biggest thing that we did was we shut down before the cases came to us. If you look at our levels of personal distancing, for example, um, or our levels of our loss of mobility relative to other states, which there are lots of, of graphs and, and websites that, that, that model these, that do mathematical modeling of this. Our decrease in our interpersonal spread has not been particularly different from other states. We dropped down to about 50% of from our normal um, movement ar out around, when we shut down, we dropped to about 50%. It's, we didn't drop to 20%. We were pretty much in line with Massachusetts or with um, you know, New Hampshire, Maine, and, and Connecticut. Um, and we've been coming up just about the same way. We, I would say that mask wearing, we are not consistent across the state. So um, I, there are other states where mask wearing is much more prevalent and other and states where mask wearing is less prevalent. So I think we fall kind of into the middle of the pack. Um, I think we benefit from our rural um, nature and from the fact that we closed schools very early, but it, it, we cannot take it for granted. You know, we, we are all the same protoplasm in this state as everyone is in every other state. And COVID will spread in Vermont the same way it will spread in Oklahoma or Tennessee, given the opportunity. Sure, but Burlington's not Oklahoma City. Burlington's not Nashville, let alone Burlington being New York or Boston. I mean, th how much do you attribute Vermont's success in containing the coronavirus to the fact that there are no disrespect meant to any people who live in Burlington or Rutland, but there are no big cities in, Burlington, in, in Vermont? How much, uh, how much does that uh, contribute to Vermont's success in containing the coronavirus? I think there's a question that lower population density is a positive, but with lower population density also comes smaller academic medical centers and less medical reserve. So again, what the, the per capita rates are probably worth looking at as opposed to the uh, act, the absolute numbers for that reason. Well, sure. And however, whether you look at per capita or absolute numbers, isn't it the case that Vermont is the best in the country? At this moment, Vermont is the best in the country, but past success is no guarantee of future success. Well, certainly, but you'd rather have some past success than past failure, wouldn't you? I think we know what to do. The question is whether we will get unlucky and have a super spreader event or whether uh, we will relax too quickly the way the South did accidentally and see another surge. 
Um, so you work with Paul Schultz on doing the projections of how much the coronavirus would cost Blue Cross over the next year or two, right? I ran the projections for the return of care. I did not run the actual numbers. Okay. So you just said that today uh, there are between 17 and two cases. The range is between two and 17 cases per day in Vermont, right? That was for the first two weeks of July. That's not for this moment right now. Okay. So two, between two and 17 for the first two weeks of July, what did you project would be the number of cases that Vermont would have over the rest of the year? How many per day? We did not. The, calcul the, the wait, 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 wait. pandemic was not part of our calculations. Those numbers, are, those numbers are included in the scenarios that uh, Paul Schultz ran, and he can tell you about those. Okay, maybe I should ask him, but let me just make sure I, I understand. You're saying, obviously, Blue Cross came out with a projection. It, it projected, in fact, that it would pay out $339 million in, uh, in 2021, in 2020, sorry. In order to do that, you have to assume, don't you, you make, a, make an assumption as to the number of coronavirus cases that would occur each day, don't you? If I'm afraid I am the wrong person to have the conversation with because my role was limited to solely projecting what percent of deferred care was going to return, um, to, that we projected was going to return over the next two to three years. I was not part of the calculation of those numbers. So I would ask you to uh, talk to Mr. Schultz about that. I will. Thank you. Um, in your pre-filed testimony, you also say that as of June 30th, I found this hard to believe, no matter how successful Vermont is, that the number of Vermonters currently hospitalized for COVID-19 is one. That's not a misprint, right? That was, that, that was true then, at June 30th, correct? That was correct as of June 30th, and as of yesterday, the number hospitalized was four. Uh, I'm say, say that again, what? As of yesterday, the ho number hospitalized was four. So the number will change. Okay. And of, do you know, by the way, on June 30th, was that one person a Blue Cross insured? I don't know that. Okay. And then, uh, then I guess you don't know of the four people today who are hospitalized. You don't know whether any of them are Blue Cross insured. No. Okay. So... I'll take you up on your invitation and ask Paul Schultz about the uh, the projections of uh, the number of people that will be hospitalized. Right. So you can make a projection as to the number of people who will be hospitalized because of the coronavirus for the next year. Correct. That's Paul Schultz's job. One of the things that I said in my profile testimony is that future projections are very difficult to make with regard to the science. And you didn't make them? No. Okay. Um, but you did make a projection as to how many people are going to come back and get care that was deferred, right? Yes. Okay. So how did you do that? For example, in that uh, you, uh, you projected, didn't you, that 100% of the people would reschedule all laboratory services, all radiology services, all durable medical equipment. That's like the scooters you see on TV that they sell on late night TV, right? That's that's durable medical equipment. So that's not actually accurate. We didn't do that. Okay, would you please turn then Dr. McIntosh to exhibit 17, page 19. While we're getting there, can I just ask, is anyone else hearing an echo? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So if, if everyone could just make sure their line is muted, except for uh, Jay Engoff and Dr. McIntosh, that might help.
So as you will see this, what we did was we looked at chronic illness and we looked at acute illness. So in our numbers, and I'm sorry, I am. And when I mute myself, should we try? Uh, um, Dr. McIntosh, I'm sorry. I'm ha I was having trouble hearing you. You were breaking up. Mr. Barber, can you hear? I can hear everyone, but I'm getting a pretty wicked echo. I'm wondering um, if we should try to figure out who it is, if we could have Dr. McIntosh and Mr. Angoff, and vice versa. Yeah. Jay, if, could you mute your line and then Dr. McIntosh, could you try speaking? So when we, it's only slightly better, sorry. When we did fitness numbers, we looked at radiology that happened, for example, as a result of. I'm, I'm sorry, this is the court reporter. I, I, I'm having a very difficult time hearing you right now. Um, the echoes coming all over. Um, well, I don't, I guess, Christina, do you have any suggestions on that? I am, at first I thought it was Jay's mic and it seems not to be that. So, um, it, people could rejoin and I read maybe Kate and Jay. Um, but because I see everyone else is muted and then of course on the phones, I can't tell if people are muted or unmuted by phone. So someone participating by phone could be the issue, but I can't tell. So this well, why is don't we do this? I, I just called in. Is that any better? Yes. Okay. So I'm afraid that the recording may not pick me up as a result, but I, I called in on my cell phone instead. Can you get a little closer to your phone to increase the volume just a bit? Yes, hang on one second. It's not the most attractive look, but hold on. Is that an improvement? That's better. Yes, okay. thank you, Dr. McIntosh. So what we did when we were looking at our numbers was we asked ourselves what conditions are going to go away and are not going to come back. So for example, if a patient was seen in the emergency room and they had, if a patient would have been seen in the emergency room for influenza, back in April, and they chose not to go to the emergency room, then they were not going to come back in June for that emergency room visit that they missed in April. Does that make sense? Whereas, so if they had gone to the emergency room in, in April for a sprained ankle, for a chest x-ray, for an acute illness, for, a, um, for anything that was not going to reoccur, if they had had pregnancy care, that was not going to come back because the baby has arrived. They're not going to show up in July for pregnancy care that they missed back, back in May. Same with the acute care that has to do with uh, acute illness. But if they have a chronic disease where, for example, they need regular CAT scans to follow up their illness. For example, they have cancer and they need regular CAT scans to surveil for recurrence of illness. Or if they have an ongoing condition that requires monitoring of blood work, that those were going to return 100%, so, or close to 100%. And as I said earlier in my testimony, that 95% uh, to 100%, that, that was not relevant. 
so you know it, it's it pretty much is going to come down in the same way. So those those were the sorts of decisions that we made. So for example, with immunizations, we decided that immunizations that we hoped that they would come back all the way. We weren't entirely sure that they would, but we hoped that they would come back all the way because there is a, a national concern in the de about the decrease of measles vaccine as a result of the pandemic and concern that we will get concurrent cases of measles along with our COVID-19. Okay, please tell me if, if I'm causing an echo or anybody can't hear or I'm breaking up. Um, but uh, Dr. McIntosh, how did you decide that 100% of all lab work would come back and 100% of all x-rays? How, how did you decide that? You mean, how did we decide that 100% of the chronic x-rays would come back and 100% of the laboratories? No, you, you don't say chronic. You say 100% of both chronic and other radiology is going to come back and 100% of both chronic and lab work are going to come back. That, uh, what, what did you base that on? Did you base that on experience? Did you base that on any studies? How did you come up with that 100%? So the, um, we, when we did our numbers, we did not decide that, that acute radiology and acute laboratories were going to come back 100%. So I did not, I am not um, the submitter of, of the articles that you're talking about. So I would suggest that you talk to Paul about, about what, what is on the page. But when we did our modeling, we assumed that chronic radiology for chronic disease would come back at or close to 100% and chronic laboratory monitoring for chronic disease would come back at or close to 100%. And that acute care, which had resolved, would not come back. Okay, so if if, uh, if this is 100% for both, that's inaccurate? That is, if this is 100% for both uh, chronic and other, that's inaccurate? So you would have to talk to Paul about the definition of laboratory other, because I cannot make the assumption from looking at this that laboratory other means acute care. So okay. I, because I did not submit this. So I would encourage you to, to talk to him about that. That's fine, I will. Uh, Dr. McIntosh, um, under what conditions, if any, does it make sense to compare the course of the coronavirus in New York City? Let's strike that. Under what conditions, if any, does it make sense to use the course of the coronavirus in New York City as a an indicator, a potential indicator of what the course of the coronavirus could be in Vermont. This is a brand new disease. It is an emerging illness. We know almost nothing about it. It has been in our lives since January or perhaps December of 2019 or January of 2020. The amount that we do not know about this illness is unbelievable. It is, it is behaving in ways that we would never have thought possible. In, May, in March, we thought this was a respiratory virus. Now we know that it's much, much more than a respiratory virus. Now we know that it is a vascular virus, that it inflames blood vessels, that it impacts the individual anywhere it touches them, whether it is in their brain, whether it is in their feet, whether it is in their lungs, whether it is in their heart, whether it is in their kidneys. It causes kidney failure, heart failure, long-term stroke, long-term disabilities, severe illness, prolonged intensive care unit stays, and we know almost nothing about it. So are you it saying- It would be not naive to assume that we can discount the experience of any State, just as it would be naive to assume that Vermont will be immune because we somehow are special. Dr. McIntosh, what's the population of Vermont? 600,000 people. Dr. McIntosh, what's the population of New York City? More than that. It's, it's about 8 million, isn't it? And people are I packed. I don't know, honestly. People are packed closely together, aren't they?
again, remember, the, demo, the importance here is not the absolute number of cases. It is the number of cases per capita because what it takes to overwhelm our facilities is very different from what it takes to overwhelm the, the facilities of a much larger metropolitan area. In the report that you worked on with Paul Schultz, and if Paul Schultz is the one I should ask about this, I'd be happy to. Do you know, why did you all use New York and Albany and Boston as comparables to Vermont with 600,000 people, rather than New Hampshire and Maine or Nebraska or the Dakotas? Why did you compare Vermont to the places where that have had some of the worst outbreaks and have the most densely populated populations in the country? Was that a fair comparison? Were they really comparables? So again, I would defer to Paul for those reasons, but I would reiterate that it is critical for us in Vermont to gather information from every possible area that we can because we know so little about what this virus is capable of doing. Okay, um, just a couple more questions, Dr. McIntosh. You're projecting that a vaccine will be available in 2021, is that right? By the end of, what, what did you say? What, what did you project as, as to when a vaccine would be available? I'm not sure we put a, a firm number on a vaccine projection because I don't know that anyone can put a firm number on a vaccine projection. Okay, could you please turn to page eight or 14 of your pre-filed testimony, that's exhibit 13. Mm -hmm. Are you there? No, not quite. Yes. Okay, so you see at the last question, what's the potential timeline for a vaccine for COVID-19? And you see there the second, the third sentence says that the, the prevailing hope is for the National Institute of Allergies to develop and implement the vaccine by the end of 2021. Do you see that? Okay, so how realistic is that in, in, your, in your view? It is a prevailing hope. It is the prevailing hope of the National Institute of Health and it is a prevailing hope. Okay, uh, th then I assume you don't, you don't believe that it's a realistic possibility for a vaccine to be ready to go at the beginning of 2021. Honestly, there are many people much, much smarter than I who would have uh, opinions on this, but I am not able to. The entire world is working very hard to find a vaccine solution, but any vaccine solution also requires being rolled out. And it is a prevailing hope among the folks who know way more than NIH that this is the timeline, but I would not even pretend to be enough of an expert to be able to give you any kind of projection. Dr. McIntosh, do you know how much Blue Cross has paid out in 2020 because of the coronavirus? I would uh, defer that to uh, Mr. Schultz. Very good. Thank you. I have no more questions. Okay, next we'll go to the board and then uh, opportunity for redirect. So I'm going to call on individual board members um, just because of the, the setting. So I'm going to start with Member Holmes. Okay, great. Um, I, how are you doing, Dr. McIntosh? Good. Good. I actually just have one question for you. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciated it. Um, and it was with respect to um, some of the work that you're doing to remove the low value care uh, from the, mm -hmm. from the system, which I really appreciate. Uh, do you have, actually I have a couple questions around that. Do you have an estimate of how much of the care that's currently being delivered you would say is low value care in Vermont? I would love to be able to do, have done that modeling for you. I haven't. I think that there, there is always disagreement about the definition of value, but modern models of healthcare do range. As, as I think you know, I mean, there are ranges of approximation. Some people say it's as much as 40%, others say it's 25%. I also think that it depends on the specialty. Um, there are certain fields where there's more low value care. There are certain areas where there's more high value care. But I do think that this, this conversation about value is important and we need to have it. 
Is that something that you said that, you know, you wish you had modeled that? Is that something that you, going forward, are going to try and model at Blue Cross Blue Shield? You know, the, the level, the degree to which there is low value care and if it varies by specialty, varies by hospital service area, things like that. Is that something, you know, going forward that you might be doing more modeling on? Well, we've already done a fair amount of it. So we did it, we've done it for certain service lines and we've done it for, uh, we did it for laboratory, which is why we went with Avalon. Uh, we have done it to a certain degree with radiology, which is, um, which we've already done. Many of our uh, prior authorization policies are written based on a fundamental idea of value as opposed to co cost. Um, we are looking at what best practices are but there is no cohesive push toward value-based care within the state as a whole. Um, and, and I think it's a wider conversation that we need to have at the, at the hospital level, at the Green Mountain Care Board level, at the practice level about what this, and at the ACO level, about what this move to high value care really looks like. Yeah, I hope we can have those conversations. Um, so I guess with, with uh, regard to that provider passport for radiology, I'm wondering, what proportion of providers in your network have the passport at the you know 99 98% level or have fit into that you know only 2% of their uh, referrals were considered not high value care what proportion of providers actually have the passport right now so it's important to remember that the passport program only we can only look at a pool of providers who order enough high cost tests to be able to fall into the category. So there are very few, if any, primary care providers on that. So it is by its nature a very low percentage because the most of the very high cost tests are ordered by specialists. So, and most uh, primary care providers don't order enough of the specific high cost tests that we're looking at to be able to even qualify. So, so we had to have a threshold at which we cut it off um, for, because you, you couldn't, base your decision about whether someone provides high value care if someone only orders one MRI a year or two MRIs a year or two MRIs on different subjects, right? It had to be, it had to be a pool of individuals who ordered enough of a single high cost test to be able to see that they were being effective or enough of a series of high cost tests in a particular category. So it is by its nature already a small program, but it's the kind of program that we really want to be able to push out further. But again, we need provider um, cooperation and buy-in to be able to have a global conversation about value. Um, and, we, and, and even sort of regulatory buy-in to have a global conversation about value to be able to push these things forward because it gets tricky when you get to the micro level. You know, it's a great idea at, at the higher level, but it's very tricky at the micro level. And we need everyone to buy in to be able to do that. Okay. All right, thank you. Mr. Chair, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I thought that I was supposed to do that. Um, I do have questions. I can go at this time or whatever order you would like, Mr. Barber. Um, I was going to give you the last shot, but if um, you want to go now, why don't you go now? Okay, fine. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. McIntosh. I was fascinated by your uh, testimony, uh, especially on the specialty drug end. Um, I can show you that uh, I just had my fourth melanoma removed and uh, wasn't even aware that there was a drug that could even treat a melanoma. Um, but, you know, when I was a kid, uh, we didn't know what sunscreen was, so that happens. Um, what level of care in an emergency room would you consider to be inappropriate based on your professional knowledge? I'm afraid I don't understand the question. So for years, it's been um, good health policy to try to encourage um, some utilizers of emergency rooms to um, seek primary care um, oversight instead. And I'm just curious, um, one of the things that uh, was hit the hardest during the pandemic was the use of emergency rooms. I'm just curious um, what level that you believe um, probably shouldn't have been there to begin with. Oh, I see what you're asking. So I, I think what I hear you asking is, we saw a significant decrease in emergency room utilization of that how much didn't need to go and how much was individuals who 
might have needed care but chose not to go? I think the honest answer is we don't know yet. Until we study that, and I think uh, places like New York City that saw a real decrease in their emergency room population are going to need to answer that question in retrospect. Because you're right, there is this question of how many people go end up in the emergency room because they're impatient and don't want to wait until tomorrow or because it's something that's more mild or because it's something that they're scared about but doesn't necessarily need to be seen. It could be seen from a phone call or some other visit with a primary care provider. And then how many visits are critical? We did a grand experiment on you know, New York City, and we're now doing that same experiment in Houston and all over, you know, all over the rest of the country. But the answer to that question lies in the in the statistics and the study of it, because it's a complex it's a complex question, and I don't have a particular answer for you. I mean, there there are probably standardized numbers of how much emergency room care is felt to be low value, but I don't have those at my fingertips. Okay, so likewise, um, we've heard a number of stories about um, fear. Um, in the, the minds of people that should be consuming care and aren't going. Have you seen any uh, professional analysis of uh, what that number could be as far as the population's fear of returning to a medical setting? I don't think that the individuals who are studying that have landed on a particular number yet. <clears throat> There's a lot of um, chatter about it, and there have been a few pay a few. Um, changes in the mortality rate from the heavier hit areas that have been put in place. But I, I think that the, the jury is still out and the actual science has not really had time to do those numbers yet. That will come. We will know that, but it may take several years. Doctor, you testified that um, you haven't canceled any uh, QHP members, which is very good. And, and uh, thank you, Blue Cross, for uh, putting in place that policy. Um, can you tell us how many members um, um, are in arrears currently and how that compares to what the normal number would be this time of year? I cannot. I would defer you to Ruth, um, to Ruth for that because I, I'm afraid that is outside my uh, purview. Okay. And um, you spoke about the current number of cases in Vermont. Can you address um, the trends as far as hospitalization rates and death rates? So Vermont uh, was very fortunate, has been very fortunate with COVID. We have had a relatively stable death rate. Um, I think we've maxed out at about 56 and we haven't moved from there for a while. Um, our hospitalization rates are, are percolating along under five right now. But again, it's important to remember that past success is not a guarantee of future of future success. Yep. And of those um, hospitalizations, do you have any type of uh, indication of what number of those would be Medicare patients as opposed to commercial insurance? I don't. The numbers of who is hospitalized are coming from the health department, and they don't parse it by insurance carrier. Um, so I think that. Uh, Paul probably has more uh, information for you on that, but I don't have it at this time. So Paul would be the person to ask about the uh, number of people that Blue Cross has seen in, as members hospitalized? Yes. Okay, I, I think that's it that I have for questions, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, next we'll go to Member Pelham. Good morning, Kate. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. So, I mean, one of the things I struggle with in this whole process is um, the kind of divergence of the goals we have in the all pair model, um, especially in this instance, uh, the three and a half percent total cost of care, you know, and getting to within those guardrails around that number in 2022. And understanding that part of that pathway uh, to that end is our investments in uh, offsetting population health measures. So I just want to pick one that um, I've raised before, and uh, it just, uh, if I'm off base, tell me, but it just seems to me like a big miss. Um, and that has to do um, on, you know, page, and you don't have to go, you know, go, go to the filing, but on in exhibit one on page 16, 
um, Blue Cross Blue Shield states that it continues to, and I'm quoting, continues to evaluate areas to achieve savings and improve the health and experience of Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont members. Um, and one area that I uh, have some concern about is the Vermont's Blueprint of Health sponsors the CDC recognized National Diabetes Prevention Program, Lifestyle Change Program. The program focuses on nutrition and fitness to help Vermonters avoid diabetes. Vermont's Department of Health says, if left untreated, up to one in three people will, with prediabetes will develop diabetes within five years. Prediabetes is treatable, but most people with prediabetes do not know it. And you know, I know that Blue Cross Blue Shield has a program for diabetes, which is in your marketing material, you know, estimated to cost about $7,400 a year with um, at least for the bronze plan, $51 a year coming out of the pocket of, 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 of the rate payer. But my question is, does uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont's QHP pl proposed plans support compensated access to diabetes prevention programs or benefits inclusive of nutrition counseling and fitness programs that parallel those recommended by the CDC? So all of our current plans put both benchmark, both the benchmark and the non-standard support a wide range of options for diabetes treatment and prevention, including nutritional counseling and the wellness drug list, which includes diabetes medications. We also have the blue extra discount on many fitness option offerings across the state. Um, we recognize that our plan design can support members in our health and wellness goals, and you're right. I mean, I think eventually the goal is to switch to a, you know, is to try to really promote the preventative model. Um, so we are continuing to collaborate with the ACO and with the Blueprint to develop and to offer targeted health programs for members. Also, this year, we're offering new non-standard plan designs that are specifically have benefits that are specified for members with a diagnosis of heart disease or diabetes. And um, so we're trying to kind of take a, a tailored approach there to try to uh, help, with, help with that prevention. Mm -hmm. Well, but my focus in the question is not diabetes, it's pre-diabetes. And so mm -hmm. uh, just a simplification, if, uh, you know, I were go to go to my uh, primary care physician and they test me, blah, blah, blah. And they say, you know, Tom, you're pre-diabetic, you know, and I said, well, doc, what do I do about that? Um, and Blue Cross Blue Shield is my insurer. Um, is there a program that my primary care physician can send me to on an organized basis where um, I can uh, you know, get the kind of program that the blueprint is running but knowing that the blueprint is running it on a shoestring. I mean, it's, I've talked to the people at the ground level in that program and they maybe get a thousand dollar stipend for a multi-week program. Um, but I, I don't find in the plan designs uh, that are before us that there is a, um, a, an organized program for pre-diabetes that engages nutrition. I can see the nutrition is for 90 bucks that you can get a, a two or three specialist visits, but there's nothing having to do with fitness. And I, I'm- so, so the nutritional counseling for prediabetes for individuals who are overweight, there are an unlimited number of prediabetic visits for nutritional counseling um, for, people who, for people who are overweight. Um, with regard to, um, to fitness, that becomes uh, the question of doing a, a sort of a full pre-diabetic program becomes an actuarial conversation. So um, the complexity of these chronic illnesses is something that would then have to be uh, placed within the actuarial context of uh, the cost of providing, you know, a fitness benefit. Okay, um, and so uh, another area that's connected to this. Um, uh, is the Vermont's benchmark plan. And as I understand it, that plan goes back to 2012 or 2014 and basically predates uh, the all-payer model and it's, it's targeted diseases, chronic diseases, et cetera. Do you have, uh, does Blue Cross Blue Shield have any um, 
uh, interest in revisiting Vermont's benchmark plan and to update it so that it is more consistent with the all pair model and the goals of prevention embedded uh, in, in the all pair model? So, as you know, updating the benchmark is a plan is a substantial process and there are many stakeholders in it. And we would very much like to be involved in and support any effort to do that. But it is also worth noting that healthcare is moving toward a more tailored approach to medicine. And given the complexity of individual chronic illnesses in Vermont, it might be preferable to have a variety of plan designs to meet the needs of many different healthcare profiles rather than to require an identical benefit enhancement for all consumers. So you don't see much value in reopening the benchmark plan and uh, just uh, trying to align it, if it needs alignment, uh, align it with uh, the goals of the all pair model. It's such a complicated uh, model that I think I can't, I don't think I would trust myself to say whether I agree or disagree at this time. Okay, and I had one more in your area. I thought that we were going to be asking questions all at one point in time, so I'm scrambling here a little bit. Um, and if I can't find it in writing, I can find it. I can remember what it was. Um, I was looking at the $600 um, uh, a kind of a, um, you know, it was, it was a, uh, no, that might not, no, that's not you. Sorry, that's not you. I'm confusing you. So that's that's good for me. Thank you for your answers. Okay, thank you. Okay, board member Yusufer. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Dr. McIntosh. Um, I just have a couple questions um, really talking about um, the drugs that you were talking about earlier. And I guess the first one is, do you have an idea, ballpark estimate of what what we spend on specialty versus generic versus how they're dispensed. Because I, I think when I was reading through that, you know, basically most of the prescriptions are generic versus the specialty. Um, but do you have any perspective on, on what those percentages might be? So it's important when thinking about specialty drugs to understand that there are specialty drugs that are considered biologic and specialty drugs that are con not considered biologic. And the biologic drugs do not have generics. So I, I want to put that out there because some of the most expensive drugs do not have generics. Most of the specialty drugs come through the medical channel and not through the pharmacy channel because these are drugs that are infused often in hospitals or doctor's offices or in outpatient settings. But they will come through the medical benefit rather than through the pharmaceutical benefit. But not all of them. Some of the specialty drugs, like the oral cancer therapies, will come through the, through the pharmacy benefit. Okay. Um, and... Just talking about um, cost saving initiatives and programs, you had on page exhibit one, page 164, there was discussion about the Civica RX, the joint venture, um, which looks to be, I think, in 2022 potentially, and we'll be introducing certain generic drugs. Um, and it said, you know, this should be a significant benefit to Vermonters with the cost for generics. and. Just want to get an idea of if you have any perspective on what that would do to cost, what type of savings that would be. Um, I don't know if that would be your area or someone else's area to talk to. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to leave the actual conversation about numbers to uh, Mr. Schultz, um, but I I do think that um, you know the Civica RX is a, a, an exciting venture that we would like to be able to pursue. Again, this is one of these areas of innovation that we would like to be able to go down um, to be able to, to bring it in, to administer it, and to pass, pass it on to the state of Vermont. But as far as the actual numbers, I'd I will defer those. Okay. Um, and do you know of any other programs that you're involved with that could bring um, savings, significant savings, whether it's through admin costs, um, you know, and when those would take place? Again, I'm going to defer that to, um, to Mr. Schultz because the, I mean, there are a series of things where I am, I am looking at value, but there are not necessarily things that I'm looking at with particular, um, at a particular eye to cost. So I will defer the cost questions to the finance folks. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thanks.
Okay, hey, board member Lunge. Thank you. Hi, Dr. McIntosh, I hope you're well today. Um, on the topic of cost containment initiatives in exhibit one on page 37, there's a discussion about a delay of uh, some 2019 programs that you had talked to, well, witnesses from Blue Cross, not you personally had spoken to last year. And those included reducing inpatient emergency, I'm sorry, inpatient readmissions, reducing ED admissions. Um, I'm wondering if you're the right witness to speak to the, the delay in um, those programs. I am probably not, unfortunately, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'm happy to, to uh, ask someone else about that. Um, on the discussion of the lab benefit, um, you testified that, um, that that lab benefit manager Avalon uh, didn't use prior authorizations as the mechanism for improving and promoting high value tests and uh, discouraging, if you will, low value tests. Uh, so what exactly are they doing to do that? Is it educational? How does that work? So Avalon, it's important to say that Avalon has two business lines, and at this time, we only use one of their business lines, and the business line that we use does not have prior authorization as a part of it. And yes, it is an educational approach. Their medical policies are um, applicable to their laboratories, and their laboratory, they work to educate their laboratories, and their laboratories work to educate the providers on what constitutes high-value care. Okay, so they're not themselves reaching out to the providers, they're reaching out to the labs, and then the, it's between the lab and the providers. Okay, thank right. you. I just wanted that clarification so I could understand how it was actually working. Um, in your pre-filed testimony, which is Exhibit 13, uh, on page... 13, you talked about the suspension of prior authorization for home infusion to allow increased utilization of that benefit during the emergency. Um, however, home infusion was a pro one of the cost containment programs that was noted as uh, being put on hold. Can you speak a little bit about the home infusion program uh, whether you've seen increased utilization in that area and the future plans for it. So home infusion, um, the, the home infusion process or the home infusion process, the ability of a member to receive their infusion at home is different from what was referred to as being an initiative that was put on hold. So the ability to receive home infusion exists in Vermont. And what we wanted to do was to open that ability within Vermont in the, in the course of the pandemic. But that's not a, a sort of project to increase home infusion, which is what was being referred to before. As to utilization and increased utilization, I'm afraid I don't have numbers on that. Okay. At this time, as to, what, as to whether there was an increase in home infusion during, um, during COVID, but we do, believe that home infusion ultimately is safer for the member because they aren't exposed to things they might catch in the hospital. And that was true before COVID and it's doubly true now. Okay, and can you explain how the, I mean, I understand how home infusion is available in Vermont, but what is the difference between that and the program that was put on hold? That's still not clear to me. So I have not been involved in the design of the program that was put on hold, so I'm afraid I can't speak to that. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm also finding my questions. <laughs> um, I wanted to turn to telemedicine. Uh, for a moment, and um, some of the efforts that Blue Cross has done to open up the telemedicine, including the phone availability during the pandemic. Um, in your pre-filed testimony, again, I believe it's on page 13, you spoke to 
the preferred telemedicine provider, that should be on line six. Is that Amwell? Yes, that is. Okay. And is Amwell a national provider? What can you tell me about Amwell? Amwell is a national provider, but I think that it's important to note that the, num the percentage of visits that we have with Amwell is in the very, very low single digits. It's, it's less than 5%, and it, we did not see a substantive increase in the COVID-19. So in the vast bump of, in, of tele, in telemedicine, I think I actually presented you those slides several months ago, the vast increase to millions of dollars that we have seen in the utilization of telemedicine, uh, we have really, we have not seen an increase in the use of our external vendors. So the telemedicine increase that we have seen has been overwhelmingly and almost exclusively Vermont-based providers providing telemedicine. Great. All right, thank you. So when um, I'm glad, actually glad to hear that Amwell is not highly used uh, because my next question was going to be, how do you ensure that there's a connection back to the primary care provider, which I know is something that you are passionate about as a former member of our primary care advisory committee. So yes, um, Amwell is, does send those records on, but at this point it is, um, it really has been a non-issue. Um, well, or rather, you have to give permission, right, for the records to be sent on. So the, if the patient uh, provides approval, that can happen. But the patient has to provide approval. And but the but the vast majority of telemedicine, this has not applied. It has really been it has really been local Vermont providers providing care to Vermonters. Great. Um, how did do you, how did you take telemedicine into consideration when you were looking at the deferred care numbers and the modeling for COVID? We really didn't. Um, the, the telemedicine, what is interesting about telemedicine is that there are very specific areas where we have seen almost no decrease in care. Mental health, for example, is one of them. They made a very rapid shift uh, to, um, to mental health. But when it comes to trying to distinguish whether a provider was going to provide care by telemedicine or by, or by office visit in person, we didn't really take that into account because there is the, 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 Payments are on par. The audiovisual telemedicine and the and the and the office visit are, are on par. So the volume of patient visits is the volume of patient visits. And there was a little bit of a drop off, and we did uh, compensate for that to say that we thought people would be coming back into the office or become more com comfortable with telemedicine. But beyond that, we really didn't um, we really didn't sort of say is telemedicine going to impact this in any particular way. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let me just check my notes and I think I'm almost done. So when you testified a few minutes ago about the surge in mental health claims, that includes the, the telemedicine claims. Absolutely, yes. Great. Um, and then what is your source of information for providers adding hours on weekends or evenings? So we have had reports from various hospitals from private practices that we've talked to regarding, uh, specifically with regard to procedures that extra hours have been added, um, you know, surgical suites, you know, being run on the weekends, things like that. And how many providers did you speak with? Um, I don't have those numbers because I did not do that initial outreach. I will have to defer. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm done. Thank you. I'm all set. Okay. Thanks, Robin. Do any Board members have follow-up questions before I turn it over to Ms. AC for redirect. Not seeing any takers. Okay, Ms. AC, do you have any redirect for Dr. McIntosh? Just briefly, <clears throat> just briefly, thank you. Dr. McIntosh, uh, if you could take a look at exhibit six, page 47 in your binder, please. Yes. 
Um, so this is a, is this a different version of the chart that Mr. Engoff was directing you to? Yes, it is. And if you look at just for example, the um, percent rescheduled services for laboratory and radiology, could you look at those numbers, please briefly? Yes. And yes. what do those num what do those numbers say? Those numbers show that chronic laboratories are expected to come back at 100% and other is expected to come back at 0%. And that radiology chronic is supposed to come back at 100% and for radiology, uh, the other is supposed to come back at 0%. And how do those numbers comport with your understanding of your input into the modeling? These numbers are consistent with the input into the modeling that we performed. Um, would you leave it to Mr. Schultz to explain the difference between this chart and the one that um, Mr. Engoff directed you to? Uh, yes, I would. I have nothing further at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Engoff. Uh, like your video is off, but do you have any redirect or re sorry recross on that on that issue? Just one, um, Dr. McIntosh. Do you know which chart is right? The one that I showed you, or the one that Ms. Asa showed you? I would leave it to Mr. Schultz to uh, describe the difference between the two charts. But what I will say is that Exhibit 6, uh, page 47, is consistent with the conversations that he and I had and what I described to you earlier as our thought process. And Exhibit 17, page 19, then, is not consistent with what you understand the survey that you participated in to uh, be based on. Again, that chart was not submitted by me, and therefore, I will leave it to Mr. Schultz to explain that chart in particular. Okay, that's all I have. Okay, I got um, some feedback that we should take more breaks this year. So we're gonna take a, a break to um, 9.55, just get a drink of water, stretch our legs before we move on to the next witness. Okay, so I'm gonna start by swearing in Mr. Schultz. Uh, could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, Mr. D'Onofrio. Thank you, Mr. Barber, and good morning to the board um, and Mr. Engoff, and good morning, Mr. Schultz. Would you please state your name and occupation for the record? Good morning. My name is Paul Schultz. I am the chief actuary for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Did you prepare and submit pre-filed testimony in this matter? Yes, I did. Um, would you identify your pre-filed testimony by exhibit number in the binder? Yes, my July 7th pre-filed testimony is Exhibit 11, and my July 13th supplemental pre-filed testimony is Exhibit 15. Was all the testimony contained in those two exhibits uh, true and correct to the best of your knowledge at the time you submitted it? Yes, it was. And, and is it so today? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you a few questions to quickly recap the rate filing that's under review in this case. Um, were you responsible for preparing Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's uh, 2021 Vermont Individual and Small Group Rate Filing, which is currently under review? Yes, I was. The filing was prepared under my supervision, and I am familiar with all aspects of the filing and the underlying rate development. And did you certify the filing? I did. At the time of, cert at the, time of the filing, um, I certified that it meets all uh, applicable actuarial standards of practice, and that it also complies with all applicable state and federal laws and regulations. And that certification still holds true today. Would you please summarize the proposed rates contained in the filing? Uh, yes, the rates as proposed would produce an average increase of 6.3%. And would you please summarize the key drivers that resulted um, in the, the proposed rates? Uh, yes, one of the key drivers, again, this year was specialty pharmaceuticals. Um, that accounts for about 3.7 percentage points of the total 6.3% rate increase. Uh, as we heard from Dr. McIntosh, these are drugs that save lives, they improve quality of life, uh, and in some cases they improve long-term affordability, but they are very expensive. Um, Specialty drugs account for about two-thirds, 
of what we pay for all pharmaceuticals at this point. It's a, it's a staggering number. Um, and that is split pretty evenly between the medical benefit and the retail pharmacy benefit. In the absence of state or federal legislation that limits the cost of these drugs, we do need to include them in the premiums. This is one instance where we are prioritizing access to care over affordability. Uh, more broadly, in the app, in the um, we would be filing a trend increase of about 9.2 percent in the absence of actions Blue Cross took to mitigate that rate increase, and in the absence of the repeal of the federal health insurer fee. Um, actions Blue, Top, Blue Cross has taken, working in conjunction with our lab and pharmacy benefit managers, saved about five million dollars uh, from the proposed premiums. Mr. Schultz, on July 14th. Uh, Michael Barber, the board's general counsel, sent a letter to Blue Cross setting forth some questions that uh, board member Pelham had provided a, in advance to allow uh, Blue Cross some, some advance notice to prepare for those questions. Did you have a chance to review that document? Yes, I did. In, um, in board member Pelham's fourth question, it, it was a three-part question, and I'd like to ask each part so that you can uh, provide some some testimony in advance to board member Pelham in, in the event he wants to follow up during his during questioning uh, time with the board. The, the first part of his question asked, has and I'm I'm reading verbatim now, quoting from the document, has BCBSVT observed over the past year and in its current trends analysis that the relationship of the cost shift to trends affecting premium rates has improved or deteriorated? What is your response to that question? Uh, yes, we've seen that premiums have continued to deteriorate because of the cost shift. Um, we were able to use data that's published by the Green Mountain Care Board uh, to estimate that 35% of all commercial payments to hospitals are due to the cost shift. And if we were able to fully eliminate the cost shift for Vermont hospitals, premiums would be lower by about 17%. Uh, now, of course, the cost shift also impacts uh, Vermont independent physicians, out-of-state providers, ancillary services, retail pharmaceuticals, uh, but we don't have any public sources of, of data available that would help us estimate those impacts on the premium. The second question uh, within uh, Board Member Pelham's question four asks, and I'm going to read verbatim again here, is BCBSVT tracking Medicaid caseloads? given the economic impacts of COVID-19, to gain insight into possible changes in the cost shift driven by higher Medicaid caseloads? What is your response to that question? So as part of this filing, we filed unit cost increases under the assumption that hospital commercial rate increases would be approved at the same level they were approved last year. If, in fact, commercial rate increases are approved at a higher level, whether that's because the cost shift is increasing due to a higher Medicaid caseload or for any other reason, then these rates would also have to be increased, uh, as Lewis and Ellis recommended. And the third part of question four asks, and again, I'm reading verbatim from uh, the document, if so, what actions might BCBSVT take or recommend to mitigate the impact of the cost shift on commercial insurance costs and rates? What is your response to that question? So Blue Cross understands that the Green Mountain Care Board grapples with the cost shift every year as part of the hospital budget review. Um, and we are supportive of any action the, the board takes to reduce or reverse the cost shift. Um, question six in uh, the document we received from the board asks whether Blue Cross, whether BCBSVT can reconcile the difference between the cumulative operating loss of $31,626,277 for 2015-2019, to shown in the actuarial memorandum, and the cumulative underwriting loss of $19,393,749 uh, thousand seven hundred forty nine dollars shown in line 11 of the supplemental health care exhibit which is exhibit 20 in the binder what is your response to that question uh, yes so the supplemental health care exhibit is prepared based on statutory accounting uh, when we assess the performance by line of business we base that upon gap underwriting results 
So those two different accounting treatments give rise to a number of, of relatively small uh, differences in results. But what's driving over 90% of the difference is that for the supplemental health care exhibit, issuers are required to display an allocation of federal income taxes uh, within the lines of business. The reason for that is that the MLR calculation, which uh, includes an adjustment for those taxes, is driven off of the supplemental health care exhibit. However, it wouldn't be appropriate when you're assessing performance by line of business uh, to include the federal income taxes in that assessment. Uh, so we look at the gap underwriting results instead. Uh, because federal income taxes has been have been negative for Blue Cross over that five-year period, the loss reported in the supplemental health care exhibit is lot less than the loss that's reported in the, in the actuarial memorandum or through underwriting results. Mr. Schultz, if I could direct you to exhibit nine in the binder, please. I'm there. And could you just identify that for the record? Um, that is the Lewis and Ellis uh, actuarial opinion. Please turn to page 23 of, the, of that document and direct your attention to the recommendations section that's just about halfway down the page. Do you see that? I do. Does your supplemental pre-filed testimony, um, which is exhibit 15 in the binder, um, regarding Lewis and Ellis's recommendations still accurately reflect Blue Cross's position with respect to these items? Yes, it does. Um, would you please uh, summarize the proposed rates as modified according to Lewis and Ellis's recommendations? Yes, as, as modified according to the Lewis and Ellis recommendations, these rates produce a 5.5% increase as compared to 2020 rates. And with respect to um, the the fourth bullet under the recommendations, um, the utilization trend, would you please explain why Blue Cross is not arguing against that recommendation today? Yes, so Blue, um, Lewis and Ellis recommends that the utilization trend is reduced to 3% from the 3.6% that was uh, incorporated into the filing. Both Lewis and Ellis and Blue Cross agree that it is necessary to normalize for population morbidity changes when performing a utilization trend analysis. But we disagree on the best way to do so. Uh, so in light of the current social, economic, and health crises and to streamline the hearing, we are electing to forego a complex actuarial argument between two assumptions that are similar and both reasonable. And what is Blue Cross's position regarding the um, the third bullet, which is entitled Consider Updated Hospital Budget Information. Um, what is Blue Cross's position with respect to l &E's recommendation in that regard? So we agree with this recommendation um, in as much as additional information becomes known about hospital unit costs, for instance, the July 31st hospital budget submissions, um, that information should be incorporated into these rates because we haven't seen the hospital budget submissions, we don't know what kind of impact that's going to have on rates. Um, we have been able to do some sensitivity testing. As I explained in my pre-filed testimony, each 1% increase above last year's approved commercial rate uh, would require an increase of about 0.4% in premiums in order to fund that additional hospital revenue. Mr. Schultz, I'd like to turn to um, the modeling that Blue Cross has done around the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, to, to begin, would you just please briefly recap Blue Cross's uh, purpose in performing the modeling? Sure. So it's impossible to know with certainty what kind of impact the COVID-19 pandemic is going to have on our claim costs in 2020, let alone in 2021, because nobody can foretell the, how the disease is going to progress. But what we can do is to model a number of scenarios and to calculate how those various scenarios would impact Blue Cross's medical claim costs and in turn its RBC. That's what we've attempted to do with this modeling. 
And are the results of the modeling process contained in an exhibit or exhibits in the binder? And if so, would you just, just give us the exhibit numbers, please? Um, yes, they are. The, our original modeling um, is part of exhibit six. And our addendum to that modeling, our refresh modeling, is in exhibit 17. Now, you don't need to turn to the individual pages, but did you hear the testimony earlier during um, Dr. Kate McIntosh's testimony regarding um, some confusion between information that appears at page 47 of Exhibit 6 and at page 19 of Exhibit 17? Do you know what I'm talking about? I do, yes. Can you clarify what um, is shown on those two pages, please? Um, yes, so uh, probably the easiest way to do so is to uh, let you know that the exhibit, I'm sorry, the, the um, table in exhibit 17 is mislabeled. Uh, so I want to take this opportunity to apologize to the board and to the parties for that. Um, totally my fault that that, uh, that document is mislabeled. So as we're looking at the assumptions that we made for each individual category, the place to find those correct assumptions is in Exhibit 6. Now, does that mislabeling that you described have any effect on the results shown in either document? I'll stop my question there. Uh, no, it does not. The 51.7 overall result that is in Exhibit 17 is accurate, um, and the modeling that we did stemming from that result remains accurate. Uh, the, the problem is simply one of mislabeling. It, it is not a material issue. Would you please describe how you created and ran the model? Um, yes. So as Dr. McIntosh testified, I and my team worked with her to develop assumptions as to the portion of returning care. Uh, that's a, I'm sorry, the portion of deferred care that is expected to return. Um, under my direction, my team also worked to develop assumptions for a myriad of other things, such as the existence, duration, uh, timing, and, and severity of a second wave, uh, the timing and efficacy of a vaccine, and the frequency and cost of testing, among a host of other variables. Um, for each of those variables, we define parameters or instructions for a stochastic model uh, and we did that by defining a range of reasonable results and a statistical distribution within that range. So informed by the statistical distribution, the stochastic model then selects at random a point within the range of reasonable results. It does that for each assumption and then calculates uh, the overall impact to Blue Cross's medical claim costs and in turn, it's RBC. Uh, we ran 10,000 simulations for each of five different scenarios as to the existence and severity of a second wave. Uh, this included a scenario where there is no second wave of illness or deferred care. This also included a scenario where the second wave looks exactly like the first wave did in Vermont. In other words, uh, the best um, the best job in the country of, of, of having low infection rates um, and low treatment costs. And we included three other scenarios as well at varying degrees of severity so that we could understand how each of those impacted claim costs or RBC. Uh, finally, we ran 10,000 additional simulations where the severity of the second wave itself was a random variable. And does Exhibit 17 reflect the, the most up-to-date results of the modeling process you've described? Yes, it does. Would you please describe the results? Yes. So in, in terms of claim costs, what we're finding is that uh, our 2020 claim costs are likely to be fairly significantly lower than what we had anticipated. But the 2021 claim costs will be higher to an equal or greater extent. Uh, altogether, over the entirety of the two-year period, uh, the results range from a slightly favorable impact on medical claim costs to a significantly unfavorable impact on medical claim costs. Um, and specifically, uh, 
we found that there were really no scenarios where we would have a windfall, if you will, from significantly lower claim costs over the entirety of the two-year period. And could you describe the modeling results in terms of impact on uh, Blue Cross's risk-based capital ratio? Uh, yes, the results to, with respect to RBC were similar. Um, they really vary from a slight increase to a slight decrease by the end of 2021. Um, notably, of the 60,000 simulations that we ran using a very broad range of assumptions, zero led to an impact of RBC that was an increase of more than 75 percentage points. Does the model incorporate all impacts to RBC of the COVID-19 pandemic? No, it does not. The model focuses on the medical claim cost impacts to RBC. Uh, there are a host of other impacts that we describe uh, within our response that's in Exhibit 6. Um, those include things like retail pharmacy utilization that we've observed as running much higher than expected through June. Um, there are advances that we've paid to providers. Uh, there's uncollectible premium that may result from the extension of grace periods, um, suspension of fraud, waste, and abuse activities, and of course, the pension losses. Um, taken collectively, and but setting the pension losses aside, all those other items collectively uh, reduce RBC by about 70 percentage points. Please describe your approach in setting the assumptions that, that uh, form the basis of the modeling. Sure. So um, wherever we could, we used Blue Cross specific data or Vermont specific data to develop our, assumption, our assumptions and to develop our ranges. Um, for example, uh, for deferred care, returning care, and treatment costs, we used uh, information that was gathered from Blue Cross Blue Shield data and from our hospital contracts. Um, we then vetted these assumptions against ranges that have been published in other national actuarial studies to verify that the ranges were reasonable. Where we didn't have sufficient data in Vermont or within Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, we borrowed ranges from these national studies or other published literature. Uh, we also vetted these ranges about against what we do know about Vermont and about Blue Cross Blue Shield data to verify that it's appropriate to use those ranges when doing a projection that's specific to Vermont. And in this context uh, of creating and, and selecting these assumptions, what does the term conservatism or conservative mean? Uh, in that respect, a conservative assumption would be one that produces a more unfavorable impact to RBC than a best estimate assumption. And did you incorporate um, conservatism or conservative assumptions in the way you just define that term into the assumptions that, that feed into the model? No, we didn't. That would be antithetical to what we were trying to accomplish with the modeling. Um, if we had put our thumb on the scale, if you will, uh, we may have come up with answers that, that had a, maybe a 25 point worse impact on RBC. But those 25 percentage points wouldn't have changed any of our conclusions. Um, so it was our intention to, to use the best estimate of some, the best assumptions we could come up with and not to include any conservatism. Uh, while we're confident that there was no conservatism in our original modeling, uh, we did do a lot of work um, between the original modeling and the addendum to eradicate any perceived conservatism that might have still existed in the modeling. So if you saw from from the original model to the updated model, if you sought to eliminate any conservatism that, that might have crept into the original model, why is it that the, re the updated results appear slightly worse? Um, that's because we also incorporated June data. June data became available uh, in time for us to do the, the modeling addendum. It was not available at the time we did the original modeling. And what that June data showed is that uh, June is emerging um, at a level of, of medical claims that is higher than what we would have expected from historical norms. Um, we weren't expecting medical claims to be higher than benchmark levels until July. So this was 
this was rather surprising to us. Um, but what it shows is that Vermont hospitals and providers are already operating at or above capacity. Um, when we incorporated that data into our modeling, uh, what it showed is that our estimate for the total amount of care that has been deferred is only about $20 million for these insured lines of business. Um, that $20 million is about 90 percentage points of RBC. Um, so when we incorporate that, when we incorporated that lower amount of deferred care into the model, that produced uh, less favorable results relative to RBC. The other piece of information that we incorporated was the recent guidance on testing from the Vermont Department of Health. Um, based upon that guidance, we actually reduced our assumption for the incidence of testing, but the cost of testing increased um, because we, we would be adding the cost of an office visit to most testing that Blue Cross has to pay for. Mr. Schultz, are you familiar with Exhibit 10 in the binder, which is DFR's um, solvency opinion and the accompanying Oliver Wyman um, report to DFR on that topic? I am. Did Oliver Wyman um, have an opinion about the existence of conservatism in Blue Cross's modeling? And this would have been the initial model, correct? Given the time. Yes, that's right. They, uh, Oliver Wyman did perceive some conservatism in, within our modeling, particularly with respect to our assumptions as to the amount and timing of returning care. Uh, they also alluded to studies performed by other issuers that resulted in a uh, more favorable impact to RBC than our modeling showed. And would you explain uh, whether you disagree with that opinion, and if so, why? I, I do disagree with that opinion. Um, specific to the portion of care expected to return, the assumptions that we are using are very well aligned with assumptions that have been published in other uh, national actuarial studies, such as uh, the one published by Milliman, and also a Society of Actuaries study. Uh, in terms of the timing of that return of care, before we had ability to, to see the June data, it's certainly understandable that we, we may have doubted that uh, Vermont providers might be operating above capacity as early as July. Now that we can see the June data, we see that, in fact, that began happening in June. Um, so we feel quite confident in the assumption that that will continue into July. Uh, with respect to what other national carriers are, are seeing, um, I, I can't comment on those studies because I don't have any access to them. Uh, what I can say is that this modeling represents a reasonable range of results based on best estimate assumptions specific to Vermont and to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. And do the results of, of Blue Cross's modeling lead you to conclude that any um, decreases are warranted in the proposed rates? Uh, they do not. The modeling shows that the impact to RBC over the entire two-year period is expected to be relatively small in the upward or downward direction. The modeling also shows that claim costs in 2021 are likely to fairly significantly outpace the 2021 claim costs that are included in this filing. Uh, because of those results, we cannot responsibly reduce these premiums below actuarially sound levels. And do the modeling results um, lead you to conclude that an increase in the proposed rates would be warranted based on the results of the modeling? The answer here, again, is no. Um, Blue Cross has committed to shield Vermonters from the additional costs related to the pandemic by paying for those costs out of surplus rather than passing them along through premiums. Uh, this is a, not a typical approach for an issuer to take. Uh, at the time we initially filed, we didn't have enough information to estimate what kind of impact the pandemic was going to have on 2021 costs. But we did know enough to believe that it was likely to be an upward impact on claim costs. Um, so what we, what we filed at the time um, we, were, we were able to satisfy actuarial standards of practice uh, because we have been instructed by senior management that any increase in claim costs due to COVID should be offset by an equal and opposite decrease in CTR, 
such that we get back to the, to the same answer. Uh, now that we have the benefit of our COVID modeling, um, we are able to actually do some, put some estimates together and see what that actually would have looked like. So we can see based on the COVID modeling that 2021 claim costs are expected to be at least $9.6 million higher um, than what we had within the initial filing. So if I were to refile today, in the absence of the, the, the direction from senior management to, to offset any increases with CTR, I would have filed a 9.7% rate increase. But because of that directive from senior management, I would have lowered the CTR to negative 1.6%. And that would have gotten me back to the same 6.3% that I originally filed. All of this is before consideration of the L&D recommendations. So to say that a little bit differently, Blue Cross is absorbing 3.2% of premiums in order to shield ratepayers from increased costs due to COVID-19 in 2021. That is no different from a 3.2% annual premium discount, and it's no different from a $10 million rebate. Now, does the modeling that you performed provide any insight into the current revenue um, shortfalls that providers are experiencing right now? Uh, yes, what the modeling shows specific to Blue Cross is that we, we cannot t look at the unexpected operating gain that we experienced from March through May in isolation. When we're considering 2021 rates, it's important to take a longer view of the, the ultimate impact of the pandemic. Uh, similarly, in terms of hospital budget revenue, of course, it's important uh, to recognize and manage the hospital revenue so that Vermonters have access to the right care at the right time in the right place. Um, but as we're making regulatory decisions about um, hospital revenue, Again, it's important to not just look at where we are in a moment, at a moment in time, but to consider our best estimate of what's going to happen over the next two years due to the pandemic. Um, so specifically, we saw in looking at the June data in our modeling that care from March through May that had been deferred is already returning. Vermont hospitals are already operating above normal capacity. Obviously, that's going to have an impact on hospitals' revenue outlooks. And it's important to consider a, a long-range uh, viewpoint on that impact, as opposed to just looking at a particular point in time and drawing conclusions based on what's emerged to date. Would you please turn to um, Exhibit 1, page 163, and that I'm using the red page numbering down in the lower left-hand corner um, of the page. Yes, I'm there. Okay. What what document are we sort of in the middle of here? Uh, we are in the middle of one of the attachments to the original rate filing, the, the, act, the original actuarial memorandum. Which attachment? Uh, attachment C, I believe. Thank you. And do you, in the middle of the page, do you see the table there on page 163? I do. Would you please... Um, explain what that table represents, and what it shows. Sure. So this table shows um, historical financial results for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont within the individual and small group line of business, the topic of the of the rate filing today. Um, I can talk about each each column in the table. The filed contribution to reserve is just what it says. It's the CTR that was included at the time of original filing um, for each of those years. The approved contribution to reserve is our um, best estimate of our expected CTR after rates had been reduced uh, for reasons other than uh, those that were actuarially sound. For example, if our CTR was explicitly reduced, that would reduce our expected CTR. If other assumptions were reduced, um, but in a way that diverged from actuarial soundness, um, that also would impact the approved contribution to reserve or our expected contribution to reserve. Uh, to the right of that, we have the actual contribution to reserve. Now, these numbers are going to be different from what you'll find if you look in our financial statements 
And the reason for that is one of timing. What we've done is to reallocate any events that um, arose for a particular year, but weren't recognized until a later year. By way of example, uh, in our 2015 financial statements, we recognized a $4 million uh, favorable true up for 2014 transitional reinsurance. That $4 million for purposes of this table was removed from 2015 because it actually arose from experience in 2014. So we moved it into 2014. This allows us to have kind of a true view of what performance was on a year by year basis. And does the table show the final 2019 numbers as, you know, based on the information available to you today? Um, no, it doesn't. This table was published before we received uh, from CMS quite recently the final amount of the 2019 risk adjustment transfer from MVP to Blue Cross. Uh, that transfer is actually a little bit less than what we had anticipated at the time of filing. So our 2019 actual result as known today is negative 0.7% as opposed to the negative 0.4% that's reported in this table. Does the table include the anticipated um, income or recovery from lawsuits that Blue Cross Blue Shield in Vermont is currently uh, engaged in against the federal government, the risk corridors case and the cost sharing reduction case? Yes, it does. It includes both. So e even though those those cases haven't reached a conclusion, uh, we did include the expected settlement amounts within this table. Specifically, that's the uh, risk corridors amounts in 2015 and 2016 and the CSR settlement amounts in 2017 and 2018. What can you conclude by comparing the approved and actual columns of this table? Uh, well, a few things. For starters, I can conclude that my team has done an amazing job uh, of accurately predicting what costs are going to be in these lines of business. Uh, I can see that over the past three years, we haven't been uh, off by more than three quarters of a percent in any one of those years. It's a very strong result. Because of that accuracy in our projections, uh, we can see that any rate cuts that are below actuarially sound levels lead to rate inadequacy. Who covers the shortfall when rates are inadequate? Policyholders do. Uh, if rates are inadequate, those shortfalls need to be paid out of policyholder reserves. Uh, DFR has mandated that our policyholder reserves must remain within a specific level. Therefore, any shortfall that results from underfunding current rates needs to be replenished by charging higher rates in the future. So in that way, um, rates that, that are lower for current policyholders must be made up for by future policyholders. So is affordability served if rates are um, set at inadequate levels? No, all this does is to shift costs from current policyholders to future policyholders. Can, can rate reductions be justified on the grounds of affordability? Yes, uh, if we're in a circumstance where filed rates are excessive, then reducing those rates does not actually deplete reserves. And if we don't deplete reserves, then future policyholders do not need to pay more in order to replenish those reserves to the level mandated by DFR. And has that type of rate cut occurred since 2014 when the board began um, regulating these rates? It has. Uh, if we look at the results in 2014, uh, we can see that the filed CTR was reduced from 1% to negative 0.1%. But actual results came in at the 1% that was uh, originally filed. So in 2014, rates were reduced, um, but it created no shortfall in reserves because actual results came in at that 1% level that had been originally filed. Now, how have the um, board's rate decisions since 2016 impacted Blue Cross's RBC? Um, in, in every instance where rates were cut below actuarially sound levels, uh, it's led to rate inadequacy and reductions in RBC. 
And can you explain what the, the impact on policyholder reserves over that period of time is? Um, yes, I can. Uh, so we can calculate that impact by comparing the filed contribution to reserve to the greater of the next two columns, the approved contribution to reserve or the actual contribution to reserve. And I say the greater of for a couple of reasons. One is that if actual contribution to reserve performs better than expectations, then there is no reduction in surplus uh, that we need to, to take into account here. Um, for example, in 2014, as I just described, even though rates were reduced below levels that appeared to be actuarially sound, um, actual results came in better than that, so RBC was not reduced. Uh, similar, but on the flip side of that, um, by using the maximum of those two columns, we are not ascribing to rate cuts any uh, downturns in performance that Blue Cross might have been ex might have experienced. Uh, in other words, performance that was worse than expectation. So if we look at 2018, for example, the actual CTR of minus 1.6 was worse than our expectation of minus 1. That difference of 0 0.6 was not due to the rate cuts. That was That was due to a downturn in performance. So focusing only on the value of any reductions in rates below actuarially sound levels, we can calculate that uh, over all of these years, um, RBC has been reduced by about $24 million or 112 basis points of RBC due to cuts below um, actuarially adequate levels. And what would those results be for the time period uh, 2018 to the present? Um, we can use the same approach to calculate this for the last two years, and we can see that RBC has been reduced by about $15 million, or 71 percentage points. And so where would Blue Cross's RBC be but for those 2018 and 19 results you just referred to? It would be 71 percentage points higher, which at the end of 2019 would have put us within our mandated RBC range. And when you say mandated RBC range, can you just briefly describe what that means? Yes, uh, DFR has mandated that our RBC should be within a range of 590% to 745%. Um, and if we are below or above that range, uh, we need to uh, submit action plans to them to describe how we intend to return to the mandated range. Does setting Blue Cross's rates below actuarially justified levels provide Blue Cross a competitive advantage? No, it does not. Uh, we are, of course, very concerned about the ongoing membership losses, and we are concerned about our rate differential between us and MVP. Um, but while we are taking every step that we can to try to address those issues, such as our good work with the lab benefit manager, we need to be in a financially sound position in order to invest in that new programming. When rates are cut below adequate levels, it compromises our RB, it compromises our RBC and our surplus and reduces or eliminates the capital that we need to invest in innovative solutions. So when we can't invest in those innovative solutions that will actually bend the cost curve by improving healthcare delivery and outcomes, uh, we are unable to make healthcare more affordable for Vermonters. And it's those same steps that would reduce our premiums and improve our competitive position as well. But wouldn't premiums be lower if you could have retained more members? Well, our administrative costs would have been lower if we had retained all of our membership in 2020. In this particular filing, premiums would be lower by about 0.2% um, because of the uh, of administrative costs being somewhat lower due to higher membership. Um, however, we can see that the membership loss had no overall impact on our rates. The reason we know that is not only through our actuarial analysis, but because we can see that we filed for a lower rate increase than MVP did. If membership losses were driving uh, rates um, upward or downward between the two carriers, then the issuer who is losing membership would necessarily file a higher rate increase than the issuer that's gaining membership. That's not the case here. Our rates are increasing no more quickly than our MVPs. So we can conclude from that that the membership losses 
do not have a material impact on 2021 rates. I'd like to turn your attention now to um, exhibit one, page 18 of the, uh, the red numbers on the lower left-hand corner of the page. Um, and when you get there, I think you'll see that that's section 1.8 of the actuarial memorandum that accompanied the filing. I'm there. Um, and do you see at the top of section 1.8 where it lays out the statutory criteria that the board uh, applies in this proceeding? I see that. Would, would you just read that passage into the record, please? Sure. Uh, when reviewing a proposed rate, the Green Mountain Care Board must consider whether a rate is affordable, promotes quality care, promotes access to health care, protects insurer solvency, and is not unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to the laws of this state. In your professional opinion, are the proposed rates, as modified according to LNE's recommendations, inadequate? No, they are not. Excessive? No, they aren't. Unfairly discriminatory? No. Reasonable in relation to the benefits provided? Yes. Unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to law? No. Are they affordable while, pr while promoting quality care and access to care? Yes, these right rates strike the best available balance among those three uh, interdependent variables that are in tension with each other. And do they protect Blue Cross's solvency? Yes. Um, have you reviewed uh, the public comments that the board has been receiving over the, the pendency of this proceeding? Yes. And those comments sh show that Vermonters, many Vermonters, are struggling right now to pay for their health insurance, right? Yes. In that context, why, how are you, are you able to conclude that these rates strike the appropriate balance, um, or I think you said the best balance available among affordability, promoting quality, and promoting access to care? Well, in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, these rates, as with any uh, health rates in Vermont, need to be assessed on the basis of the total population or community that purchases these plans. We can't divide, derive these rates based upon individual circumstances. Uh, in fact, we are prevented from doing so by Vermont law. So by way of example, I cannot construct a rate for a 30-year-old um, who might have somewhat lower income and few health conditions that's different from a rate for a 60-year-old who might have higher income and a whole host of medical needs. Uh, Vermont community rating laws do not allow me to develop rates that are different for those two individuals. Um, the rate must be the same for the entire community. So because of that, I, we have to consider affordability on a community level rather than thinking about it from an individual, uh, very specific level. The second thing that, that I can think about uh, is how our cost of insurance compares to that of the rest of the industry. Uh, these rates consist of really three main parts. First are taxes and fees. Those are set by the government. Issuers have no control over those amounts. Second, and this is the majority of the rate, are claims. Uh, claims at their essence are amounts that providers are paid. So while Blue Cross does everything that we can to try to bend the cost curve, whether that's participating in Vermont's various initiatives or developing programming of our own, at its core, that portion of premium is really a financial transaction wherein we are receiving premium payments from Vermonters and we are redistributing those payments to providers uh, to pay them for the care that the policyholders are collectively consuming. So that leaves us with the cost of insurance, which I'll define as the sum of administrative costs, CTR, and profit margin. Uh, now, this is one place where we can exercise significant discretion because we have a lot of control over our administrative costs, our CTR, and our profit margin. Uh, and, you know, l &E has looked at and analyzed where we stand relative to other carriers for those elements. What they found is that in terms of administrative costs, our administrative costs as a percentage of premium 
are lower than 90% of the plans that they, that they assessed alongside of us. In terms of CTR, our filed CTR of in 2020 of 1.5%, which is our same filed CTR this year, was lower than 80% of all individual and small group filings nationally. And of course, as we all know, there is no profit margin in these rates. So our cost of insurance is among the very lowest in the entire industry. Mr. Schultz, would you please turn to exhibit 23? Yes. And when you get there, please explain what this is. It's a lot of pages to flip over. Yes. OK. Um, so this graph is a comparison of Blue Cross Blue Shield's MLR over time as compared to the uh, average MLR across the entire industry from the years 2011 through 2019. Uh, the blue line shows uh, Blue Cross's actual MLR results. Uh, and this is derived from the underwriting results that I described earlier in, in terms of how we assess performance by line of business. The red line is taken from a Kaiser Family Foundation study uh, that we cite in the second footnote. Uh, Mr. Schultz, just I'm looking at a black and white copy, just in case anybody else is. Would you please describe sort of visually which line is the Blue Cross line and which line is the national average line? Yes, the Blue Cross line is the flatter line. It, it starts and ends above the other line. Uh, the national line is the one that, that kind of has a big spike up followed by a big spike down. Um, that's the... That, that's the national line that I referred to as the red line for those of you with a color copy. And the so the um, the national average line you said is derived from a Kaiser Foundation study. Can you just say a little bit more about about what that study was and and how you found it? Um, yes, I I found it online. Uh, Kaiser Family Foundation uh, does an awful lot of very interesting reporting relative to this line of business. Um, and I, I try to stay abreast of that reporting. Um, so in, in reading uh, a study that they did about how insur issuer MLR has changed over time, um, and as that may relate to ACA rebates, um, I, you know, I found and read this study, uh, found, the, found the graph, and thought that it would be useful to compare to uh, Blue Cross's results over the same time period. So the, the national average line that appears on Exhibit 23 is taken from a, a, a figure and from data contained in that Kaiser study? Yes, that it, it's taken from that publicly available Kaiser study. That's correct. And did you oversee the preparation of this document, Exhibit 23? Yes, I did. Um, Mr. Barber, I move Exhibit 23's admission, uh, noting again for the record that the HCA has agreed to its admission. Yeah, I'll admit it into the record. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions, and then we will be um, done with your direct testimony, Mr. Schultz. Uh, can you just describe what MLR is? Yes, MLR, uh, which stands for medical loss ratio, uh, in its simple form is, is simply the portion of premium that is consumed by claim costs. If we ignore taxes and fees, then MLR is the inverse of the cost of insurance that I talked about earlier. So a 80% MLR would equate to a 20% cost of insurance. Uh, MLR as defined by the ACA is a little bit more complex than that. The ACA allows issuers to make adjustments for taxes and fees, uh, and also to make adjustments for quality improvement initiatives. Uh, generally speaking, the, the ACA MLR will be somewhat higher than the simple comparison of claim costs to premiums. Um, if an issuer in the individual and small group line of business has an ACA MLR that's below 80%, they have to refund the entirety of that excess cost of insurance back to ratepayers. What does this document show us regarding the industry's cost of insurance over time? Um, so it, it shows us some interesting patterns, and I, I think it's easiest to think about this in, in three three-year segments. 
So first from 2011 through 2013, which is before the ACA went into effect, uh, we can see that issuers were really consistently producing MLRs in the low 80s. Um, this indicates that they were able to price very accurately based upon the laws and regulations that were in place in their jurisdictions uh, prior to the ACA coming into play. Now, when we move to 2014 through 2016, we see a very significant spike upward in MLR. Uh, we know that in the early years of the, of the ACA, issuers lost billions of dollars. Uh, we can remember the significant market exits that took place. Uh, we can remember the many co-ops that went out of business. So these MLRs that are very high is not what these issuers were targeting. This was a pricing issue. When the ACA changed all the rules, uh, many issuers nationally had a lot of trouble trying to price this business. Um, and we can see that in the next three years, they really corrected for that. So from 2017 through 2019, I would, I would refer to that as a market correction. So nationally, we saw a few years of very, very high premium increases. And we can see that by 2018, I would argue that issuers nationally overcorrected for the money that they had lost in the preceding period from 2014 to 2016. That 70% average MLR nationally stands in dramatic contrast to the 93% MLR that Blue Cross experienced at that same time. Uh, finally, in 2019, we can see that, that national issuers are finally kind of starting to revert to that area in the low 80s um, that they were targeting pre-ACA. What does the graph suggest about um, ACA MLR rebates? Sure. So the, the graph suggests a couple things. First, we, we know this isn't on the graph, but we know that issuers paid more in ACA MLR rebates in 2019 than they had in any previous year. Uh, and what the graph shows is that because those ACA rebates are based on a three-year average, we would expect that issuers are going to pay quite a bit more in 2020 than they even than they paid in 2019, which had been a record. Uh, furthermore, because of the deferred care that's taking place in 2020 and the three-year averaging, it's likely that MLR rebates uh, in 2021 will be even more enormous than MLR rebates in 2020. Uh, we can compare that to the experience of Blue Cross. Blue Cross has never had to pay an ACA MLR rebate for these lines of business. We don't expect to need to pay a rebate in 2020, and we don't expect to need to pay a rebate in 2021 because we don't overcharge ratepayers. And what does the what does the chart um, show about Blue Cross's cost of insurance over time? Um, so a, a couple things here too. First, it shows that our MLR and our cost well and our cost of insurance have been very stable. Uh, that indicates to me that we've done a, a good job pricing in this line of business kind of in contrast to what we've seen nationally where other carriers have really struggled to price ACA business. Um, the second thing that it shows me is that we are well above the minimum threshold uh, within the ACA. So that's that at 80%, we have a dotted line on the chart. That's the ACA minimum threshold. We have historically and consistently been well above that. Uh, most issuers are targeting an MLR that's just above that 80% line. Uh, our cost of insurance is less than half of that. Do the conclusions that you're able to draw from this chart um, relate back to affordability? And if so, please explain. They do. So again, what this, what this chart shows about our cost of insurance is that we have been able to limit that cost of insurance. And again, that's the portion of premium over which we exert some firm control. We've limited that to industry leading levels in order to provide the most affordable rates possible while still providing access to the high quality care that Vermonters demand and that Vermont hospitals and doctors provide. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. I have no further questions at this time. Uh, reserve right to ask questions on rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Angoff, do you have questions for Mr. Schultz? 
Yes, I do. Good morning, Mr. Schultz. Good morning, Mr. Angoff. Um, am, I, I'm, am I correct in assuming that you had nothing to do with the decision to make the investment that, lot, that resulted in a $40 million loss to Blue Cross? You are correct, yes. Okay. Um, did, am I correct in assuming that you have nothing to do with developing the investment guidelines Blue Cross follows uh, governing uh, the assets that it will invest in? Also correct. Okay. Do you know what the investment was that Blue Cross made that resulted in the $40 million loss? No, I don't. You've never had any, you've, you've never been involved in any discussion at Blue Cross about what that investment was? No, I have not. Okay. Um, and that $40 million investment is equal to approximately 180 points of RBC. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Could you explain how, how the 40 million, does that mean that for each, each million dollars is equivalent to whatever it is, four plus points of RBC ratio? Is that how Objection. it works? Objection, not relevant, and ask and answer. And I apologize, I was on mute. I would have objected from the beginning of this line of questioning. I apologize. So I need a, a repeat of the question. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I didn't hear you. I need you to repeat the question, please. Yeah, is it correct that the uh, that in order to uh, arrive at our, the number of RBC points that a, a loss equals, you've got to multiply the, the amount of the dollar loss by a certain factor. Objection to the form of the question, and I'd like to add another basis for my objection, which is we, in our uh, June 26th letter from Don George, Blue Cross requested that the board and parties, if they had questions about the pension loss, provide those questions in advance in writing. There's nothing about these questions that couldn't have been um, developed ahead of time. So those are all of my grounds for objecting to this line of questioning, Mr. Hearing Officer. Mr. Hearing Officer, nothing could be more relevant to the board's decision on Blue Cross proposed income than the fact that Blue Cross has lost 180 points in RBC ratio through no fault of the, the Vermonters, through only its own fault. The reason it is so relevant is that the, as, as Mr. Schultz was just explaining, the reason it is so relevant is that the lower the RBC ratio, the more Blue Cross needs to charge tax, needs to charge its ratepayers. Now, the board's counsel asked Blue Cross some very, very reasonable questions about this investment, about what it was, how it came to be, whether it, whether it complies with the law, whether Blue Cross notified the commission, very reasonable questions. And what Blue Cross told the board was to go jump in the lake. They said, we're not answering your questions. I think that it's essential. It's essential for the board and it's essential for the board on behalf of Vermonters to insist on answers to those questions because that money that they threw away is, I'm afraid, going to result in higher rates to Vermonters unless Mr. Schultz can guarantee right here that it never will do that. So the question that, sorry, I'm getting some echo here. Um, the question, as I understood it, was uh, about the how many RBC points does a million dollar loss equate to? That that seems to be relevant. So to the extent I understood the question correctly, Mr. Schultz, could you please answer the question? Yes, happy to. Uh, a, a million dollar loss equates to about four and a half points of RBC. And Mr. Schultz, could you give the board some idea of how much $40 million is. For example, what percentage of Blue Cross's 
total surplus before that loss does that $40 million represent? Um, I, I think Ruth Green is going to be in a better better position to answer that question. I, I could try to find the number of our surplus and do a little bit of quick math, but we're probably better served by, by asking our CFO the answers to those questions. Well, I suppose that's fair. Dr. McIntosh said you answered the questions. Now you're throwing Ms. Green under the bus. Fine, I'm happy to ask. Objection, Mr. objection. Sustained. I'm happy to ask Ms. Green. Um, can you tell me, you're, you're responsible obviously for the rate filing, correct? Yes, that's right. Can you tell me how this $40 million that Blue Cross lost in this investment compares to the contribution to surplus, or as you guys call it, contribution to reserves, that Blue Cross has filed for and been granted from the board in its history, that is, since the new ACA system started up? Object to the form. Answer if you understand the question. Um, I, I'm going to need a little bit of clarity on that question, if you don't mind. Sure. What is the total that, in in, do, in dollars approximately, that Blue Cross has received from the board, in that is that the board has approved, in contributions to reserves or contributions to surplus, since the, uh, the since the beginning of this system with the board regulating rates. Um, so I'm referring again to page 163 of Exhibit 1, um, which I think doesn't quite have all the information I would need to do that calculation. Uh, but I can I can see that the approved contribution to reserve over time has been about 0.3% of premium. Um, that is probably in the neighborhood of about $6 million. Okay. And... And the system's been going for six or seven years. Uh, that's six years of experience. Yeah. Okay. So that so that's six times. Uh, I'm sorry. Six, six about six times six million dollars. Then. Um, no, I'm sorry. So you know, each year the board might approve a different CTR. Uh, our expectation after the 2019 decision, for example, is that our CTR would be zero. So in 2019, we can compare that $40 million to zero. Uh, in 2018, we expected that our actual CTR would be negative. So it, now we're comparing to a, a negative number. Okay. Um, Mr. Schultz, can, can you guarantee that Blue Cross policyholders will never pay directly or indirectly for the $40 million that Blue Cross has lost in this investment? Objection. I think um, that's, I, objection I think, on, oh, hold on. Objection yeah. on what grounds? Um, it, it's it's asking the witness to do the impossible, essentially. Guarantee the outcome of future events. Well, he can answer for himself. Um, Mr. Angoff, could you please repeat the question? Yes. Mr. Schultz, can you guarantee that Blue Cross policyholders will never pay directly or indirectly for the $40 million that Blue Cross has lost through the investment that it made this year. Object to the form, you can answer. What I can say is that we're here today to talk about the 2021 rate filing and that not a single penny of that $40 million has been included in the 2021 rate filing. That was not my question, though, Mr. Schultz. I'll repeat my question. Can you guarantee that Blue Cross policyholders will never pay directly or indirectly for the $40 million that Blue Cross lost in connection with its investment this year? Objection. To the extent Mr. Angoff is asking a question that projects beyond the rates before the board, the question is, is seeking testimony that's irrelevant. Again, I think it, it couldn't be more relevant. This board regulates the rates, decides whether to approve or disapprove the rates that Blue Cross filed. Correct. The board has jurisdiction over the filed rates before it, which are the 2021 rates. And that question's been asked and answered. It, it's been asked. It hasn't been answered. What is your response to the, the 
objection, Mr. Angoff, that the rates before the board are for 2021 and do not extend beyond. I mean, to the extent that he's answered the question as it relates to the rates for next year. My response is the board has the authority over rates, not just this year, but for next year. And in addition, my response is that the answer to Mr. Schultz's question, if he does answer it, I think would have an effect on the board's decision as to what to do with respect to the rate increase this year. So, for example, if Mr. Schultz were to say, yes, I can guarantee that no way, one way or the other, will Blue Cross charge its policyholders for the 40 million bucks that Blue Cross lost, that might have a different effect on what the board's decision would be than if Mr. Schultz were to say, I can't guarantee that because 180 points of RBC ratio is a lot. And if it turns out that because of this 180 point loss, the RBC ratio falls to a low level, say below 500, unfortunately, regrettably, we're going to have to raise policyholders' rates to pay for it. So clearly, Blue Cross Blue Shield's solvency is an issue before the board um, and the impact of the rate on solvency. Clearly, the pension loss has an impact on solvency. I think it's relevant over what time period that impact will be felt. Uh, I'm going to allow this line of questioning, but um, we, um, but yeah, so proceed. You can proceed with your question, Mr. Angoff. Could you repeat? Uh, it, can, can the report, well, well, should I ask, Mr. Hearing Examiner, should I ask it again or should I have the reporter read back the question? How would you like to proceed? Could you please restate the question for the witness? Yes. Mr. Schultz, can you get, commit to the board that Blue Cross policyholders will never pay directly or indirectly for the $40 million that Blue Cross lost this year through its investments? Quite frankly, that decision is above my pay grade. So no, I personally cannot make that guarantee one way or the other. I will move on. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Mr. Schultz, to what do you attribute the great success that Vermont and Vermonters have had in containing the coronavirus pandemic? Well, Dr. McIntosh is the expert in this area, so I would <laughs> refer to, to her testimony. She's, she's already testified about this. She's asked and answered. I rely on her expertise uh, in these sorts of matters. They, they really aren't an actuarial matter. Uh, what Dr. McIntosh testified, to the best of my recollection, is that she gave a lot of credit to the governor. Um, she, she gave some credit to good fortune as well. Um, I appreciate that. Do you have anything to add to what Dr. McIntosh testified to? I have nothing to add. Very good. You remember, don't you, that doc, when I asked Dr. McIntosh what she assumed in the modeling that you and she and your teams had done as to how much Blue Cross would pay out uh, this year due to the coronavirus, she said she didn't know, and I should ask you. So consider that question asked. How much, well, well, well I'll, I'll ask a series of questions. Number one, Dr. McIntosh testified that today the number of cases per day varies between 17 and two. The range is between two and 17. Do you remember that? I do remember that. Okay. What did you assume as to the number of new cases that Vermont would experience per day in coming up with your projections that you set forth in the, uh, in, in the addendum, which I, I believe is Exhibit 17? 
Yes, in, in that modeling, we assumed that Vermont would see seven to eight additional cases per day, which matches the average from June forward. You assume that Vermont would, say, would, would see seven to eight cases a day for the rest of the year? Yes. Okay. And then what did you assume as to what would happen in 2021? So we assumed. Uh, so we assumed a couple of things. I, I should I should clarify um, my my original response. So we did assume that through August, Vermont would continue to see seven to eight cases per day. From September through December, with the return with with, with the potential return of students to schools and to universities, we allowed the modeling to vary from between that seven to eight level to something as much as I believe ten percent higher than that. And then for 2021, we allowed the model to take a random variable, um, again, choose a random variable anywhere between the seven to eight cases to a day and a maximum of about 15 to 16 cases a day. Okay. I was just going to say, I'm not going to, I would, wouldn't quibble with you about 10% one way or the other, but the difference between seven to eight and 15 to 16 is pretty significant, isn't it? How did you cut? How did you come up with that 15 to 16? Yeah, again, that's based on an expectation over time that as we continue to loosen uh, social restrictions, Dr. McIntosh testified about in the fall and winter, especially when everybody is within enclosed spaces, it's likely that the virus is going to spread more rapidly uh, than it has thus far. Uh, so we, we included that full range of where we are today to a level that's about twice that high and allowed the model to randomly select a value within that range. So some of our simulations say that the uh, infection rate in Vermont will never be higher than what it's been in June and July. Other of our simulations uh, take a look at what happens if that infection rate is about twice as high. Based on everything Dr. Kate uh, testified about, it seems pretty unlikely that the infection rate is going to, to decrease from here. Um. Can you show me where that data, which you just described, is in your uh, modeling addendum, Exhibit 17? I can certainly try. Um, so it, it should be addressed in the treatment cost section. And I will direct you to uh, page four of Exhibit 17. Uh, the bottom of page four, we talk about how we dampened the incidence rate. Um, and so we dampened it by about 50%. That's because that seven to eight new case average that we've seen in July and in June is about half of what we saw um, over a time period that was studied by the Society of Actuaries from March 22nd through May 17th. The Society of Actuaries studied uh, these infection rates by medical service area for the entire nation. Um, and what they found for the Burlington Medical Service Area, and this um, also tied very closely to statistics reported by the Vermont Department of Health, is that over that time period, uh, infection rates were about at um, uh, twice that level of seven to eight that we've experienced in June and July. So when we talk about the 50% dampening, that's another way of saying we're assuming seven to eight new cases a day uh, for, for uh, July and August. So you mean in earlier in the year, in March and April, there was a greater incidence of cases, in fact, twice the incidence of cases that there is currently? That's right. In, in March, well, late March and very early April, in fact, the incidence was was many multiples higher than what it is currently. And then that dampened by the end of April uh, to a level of about four cases a day. And that's what we experienced for much, much of the month of May. So when we look at that Society of Actuaries timeframe, that includes both the very large spike we saw in March and April, and it also includes a very kind of a long portion of the very low incidence we saw in May before some of the social distancing restrictions were loosened. So if I understand you then, the, the, the trend in, obviously everything's starting from a very low base, but the trend in coronavirus cases in Vermont has been down 
since March. But you're projecting a higher incidence later in the year. Why is that? No, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, let, let me explain again. I think you, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. So we're projecting that for July and August, it will be about 50% of that time of the level of that time period from March through May that includes some much higher incidents and includes some very low incidents. That 50% assumption matches the seven to eight cases per day that we've seen in, in June and thus far in July. So for July so far, it's been a very accurate assumption. Okay, if, if I'm interested and if the board is interested in the, in hard numbers, pure, the pure number of cases, number of infections, number of hospitalizations, numbers of deaths. Is that in here? Is, is there any place where we can find something to the effect of we assumed eight cases or 16 cases, or we assumed 60 deaths or 90 deaths? Is there anything like that in this, uh, in this addendum, uh, Exhibit 17? No, we did not summarize our modeling in that way. Okay. Um, you remember also uh, Dr. McIntosh testified that uh, even though there was just one hospitalization as of June 30th, uh, today uh, there are four and they, they fluctuate between one and four. Do you remember that? I do remember that, yes. Okay. What did you assume as to the number of hospitalizations from here on out during the rest of 2020? and then for 2021. So again, we didn't summarize our modeling in that way. I'd be happy to, to follow up with that answer. That answer is going to be very low. Um, we're assuming seven to eight new cases per day across all of Vermont. Uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield insured business accounts for well under 10% of the, the total Vermont population. So just in terms of new infections, we're expecting within our insured lines well less than one person per day. Uh, now, hospitalization, we, we took, again, from, we used some national statistics for that, um, some, some published data for that, and we compared it to Vermont data on Vermont hospitalizations during the peak period to understand how many positive cases tend to result in a hospitalization. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna avoid doing math on the fly, but the hospitalizations per case was obviously well less than 100%, um, way less than 50%. So the, the number of hospitalizations of, of Blue Cross insured members that we're assuming is going to be very, very low. Okay. Um, well, then let me ask you this. Can you turn to, on Exhibit 17, uh, page... 22. Sure. <clears throat> okay, I'm there. Okay, and you see the first number under 2020 is 339 million. You see that? Yes, I do. Okay. Of that projected paid claims of 339 million, how much of that is paid coronavirus related claims as of? whatever the data is that Blue Cross has those uh, th th those numbers available? Well, zero. Those are baseline claims in the absence of coronavirus. Okay. Uh, then where are your, where in this addendum is your estimate of coronavirus claims costs in 2020? Sure. So you can see that in the direct costs row. So we have these, as I, as I testified earlier, we have these various scenarios as to what a second wave might look like. Um, so let's, for the sake of simplicity, stick to there is no second wave. Uh, the direct costs that we're paying for coronavirus treatment are projected at $4.3 million. With, that is uh, just over 1% of the total claims projection for the year. Okay. Leaving approximately $335 million in non-coronavirus-related claims, correct? Again, the $339 million is a baseline number. 
So the $4.2 million would increase that 339 up to 342, I'm sorry, 344. Okay, of that 339 million in projected paid claims, how much has Blue Cross paid to date? So the, the question as I understand it is what, what is the total amount of paid claims that Blue Cross um, has paid through June? And I don't have that number at my fingertips. Okay, um, could you please submit that number to the board and to the healthcare advocates so we can use it in our post hearing memor memorandum? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, the reason I ask that, if you could go, Mr. Mr. Schultz, to page two of Exhibit 17 and read the first line of paragraph three. On July 7, Blue Cross's actuarial team completed the monthly incurred claims estimates that incorporated claims paid through June 30th, 2020. Okay, so that's the, you can understand why I would be asking that question, can't you? Because this statement says we incorporated the claims paid through June 30th, 2020. So it, it is maybe it is our paid claims paid through June 30th, 2020 in this addendum at all. Yes. Well, the, the, the amount is not in the addendum. Uh, those claims payments to date are in the modeling. Okay. That's what I'm asking for. I'm asking for the amount of paid claims. How much has Blue Cross paid out so far in 2020? I thought from this statement that it would be in the addendum. You've just told me it's not, correct? That's object right. To the, object to the form of the question. There was some testimony in there from counsel. Why is it not in the agenda? Uh, because it's not particularly relevant. That specific number is not particularly relevant to the modeling. Other numbers like the amount of deferred care are very relevant to the modeling and those numbers are reported within the addendum. And you don't think the board should be able to decide whether the amount of paid claims that Blue Cross has made in 2020 is relevant or not? Object to the form of the question. You can answer if you can. So, Mr. Angoff, I would say that I, I did not include every possible number within this addendum. Uh, within the limited amount of time I had to put it together, I included what I thought was the most relevant information for the users of the addendum. Uh, if, if the HCA or the board would like to see some additional information, I will be more than happy to provide it. Thank you. I will accept that offer. Yes, we would like to see the paid claims data. And I assume that I won't speak for the boards, but the HCA would certainly like to see the paid claims data to, uh, to the extent that it, it is available for 2020. Um, could you turn, please, Mr. Schultz, to page three? And I just want to ask you a question or two about certain terms. I'm page three of, exhi of Exhibit 17, are you there? I am. Okay. Um, the first full paragraph, the second line, the second sentence talks about completion factors and margin. Could you just explain to me and to the board what a completion factor is and what margin is? Sure. So a, a completion factor is an estimate uh, of given paid claims through a certain date. What will the total incurred claims for a given period be? Uh, so and what I mean by best estimates before margin is that for purposes of financial reporting, uh, we are required to use estimates that include an ele element of conservatism. We removed that element of conservatism when performing the, the incurred claim projections for this modeling. Okay, and, and what, if anything, is the difference between margin and profit? There's a huge difference between the two. Um, we're a not-for-profit. There is no profit anywhere in anything that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont does. What margin means in this context is that, again, we are required uh, for statutory accounting purposes to include some element of conservatism within the projections that we're doing. That's a requirement because uh, statutory accounting requires that we consider moderately adverse conditions 
uh, when we're putting that accounting together. That's not a decision Blue Cross makes. That's, that's a required element of that accounting. So when we're using margin in this context, it has absolutely nothing to do with profit. It doesn't even have anything to do with policyholder reserves or CTR. What it means is it's an explicit margin that we include in our completion factors for purposes of producing financial statements as required by statutory accounting principles. Could you turn please to page, uh, to exhibit six, page 59. And there are a lot of numbers on that exhibit. And I would like you to go through them with me uh, so that I understand what they are and the board understands what they are. Okay. Are you there? I am. Okay. Um, so uh, across the top, you've got uh, five columns, Vermont Capital Region, no second wave, Boston, suburban Southeast New York. You see that? I do. Okay. What, what is, why do you, um, no second wave, no second wave, I think I understand what that means. No second wave means you're, you're assuming there will be no second coronavirus wave, correct? Yes. Okay. Then with under the other four columns where there are no numbers, what what do those uh, what what do the headings for those columns uh, denominate? Sure. So these have to do with our various scenarios as to the severity of a second wave. So as uh, you correctly pointed out, we did model what happens if there is never a second wave. Uh, in the in the leftmost column, we modeled what would happen if Vermont experienced a second wave, but it was exactly the same as the first wave. That is to say, the, the best experience in the country in terms of preventing infection uh, and preventing hospitalization and death. Um, so in order to provide a, a variety of scenarios, we thought it would be instructive uh, to look at what's happened in other nearby regions and see what the impact of Vermont would be if our uh, experience within a second wave matched something that was more like some of these other areas. So I'm, I'm not trying to make any predictions that Vermont is going to suddenly look like suburban southeastern New York, but for purposes of understanding what a scenario like that looks like, we did model it and we did summarize those results within this, this page. Mr. Schultz, have you ever sold a house? I have. Okay. And when you try to figure out, or when the real estate person tries to figure out how much to ask for your house, they look at comparables, right? They do. Okay. Could you tell me why you thought, why you think apparently that Boston and what you call Southeast, suburban Southeast New York, which I assume is a euphemism for metropolitan New York, can you tell me why you, you use those as comparables rather than Maine or New Hampshire? or Wyoming, or some other sparsely populated state. I'm going to object to the form of the question. You embedded an assumption about what the witness thinks or doesn't think, and it contains some argument. But if you're able to follow the question, you can answer. Thanks, Mr. D'Onofria. Um, so first, I'll just say suburban southeastern New York is not a euphemism for New York City. Um, we, we used White Plains, as it happens. Uh, infection rates were very similar in most areas in New Jersey as well. Uh, I don't think that's what's going to happen in Vermont. To repeat my testimony, uh, we modeled a number of different scenarios that range from the very best experience in the entire country to one of the worst experiences in the entire country. We did not model an experience that, that would be something that was like Italy experienced or some scenario that is something that hasn't been experienced by anybody anywhere. Uh, we looked to nearby areas uh, for the purpose of informing us what happens if Vermont's experience in the first wave is not as good. I'm sorry, if Vermont's experience in the second wave is not as good as it was in the first wave, where we were, as many witnesses have stated, um, and, and some council as well. We, we had the best experience in the country in the first wave. Uh, if you don't derive value from those Boston or suburban southeastern New York columns, then 
by all means, feel free to ignore them. That's why we included the Vermont column. That's why we included the no second wave column. Okay, let's go, let's go through these numbers. Um, I see the 567 RBC, I get what that is. That, that's the RBC, Blue Cross's RBC ratio as of the end of the year last, in 2019, correct? Yes. Okay, and then impact of changes in insured volume of a, of a plus 75%. What does that mean? Simply put, uh, our insured membership declined from 2019 to 2020. Uh, because of that, the denominator of the RBC calculation will also decline, uh, which means that for a given level of surplus, we actually have a higher RBC, not by virtue of having increased that surplus, but by virtue of the denominator being lower. Okay, so so the fewer insureds you have, all other all else equal, the fewer insureds you have, the lower RBC can be. Correct. Well, okay. I'm sorry. The fewer the the fewer insureds we have the higher RBC will be for a given level of surplus. Okay, I'll, I'll accept it that way. Um, just very briefly, um, I know you talked about this a little bit and I don't wanna, wanna prolong this, but why is Blue, why is Blue Cross lost so much business? Uh, we attribute it to the pricing differential that exists between us and MVP. Uh, that's a pricing differential that's, that's existed for quite a long time. Um, uh, that differential won't get any worse based on this year's filing, but neither will it get better. Um, and we've, we've seen uh, membership losses over time primarily for that reason. Did you ever think that maybe if you asked for a little less of a rate increase, you'd have more members and that that would be better for the company overall? Well, I, I testified to this earlier as well. Uh, the membership changes do not actually have that much of an impact on the 2021 rates. Uh, we can see that because we're not asking for a bigger increase than MVP. Uh, we can see that through our analysis as well. I also testified that in as much as rates are underfunded, and that's what I take your question to mean, if we were to intentionally fund rate, ask for premiums that were below actuarially sound levels, what that would do is reduce our, our surplus and make it less possible for us to invest in new programming like the Civica RX initiative that can actually bend the cost curve and lower costs for Vermonters. What we have to do here, in other words, is not present some sort of nominally lower rates that are going to deplete our surplus and compromise our ability to implement programming that will in fact bend the cost curve. What we need to do is to have the ability to invest in that programming so that we can bend the cost curve, both through participating in Vermont state initiatives and through implementing our own programming. Okay. Then the next number is projected impact of 2020 operating results. You say that that reduces uh, RBC by 17%? Yes, that's right. Um, it's important to take that in conjunction with the next number, which is a plus 16% for investment results. Our, um, as, as we talked about our historical financial performance, um, our operating results in the absence of investment income uh, have tended to be zero or negative over the last several years. We expect that to continue uh, based upon rates that were approved versus rates that were uh, requested. And we expect further that the investment income will offset the operating losses. Okay, so, so let me ask you about each of those individually because neither of them seem to make sense to me. I may be missing something, but when you say projected impact of 2020 operating results is a loss of 17 points, th th what that means, isn't it, is that you are losing money on your 2020 business, correct? That means that we're not making, uh, we're, we're going to make less, we expect to make less than the one and a half percent CTR that is required to maintain a constant level of RBC. Okay, and so is that negative 17 net of how much you all save because of minimal coronavirus costs? Or is that, I, 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 just based, strike that, let me ask it again. Can you, you agree, don't you, that Blue Cross is, will be paying out in 2020 less than Blue Cross projected 
in 2019 that would be paying out in 2020? Yes, I do. Okay, if that's the case, if you're paying out less than you for 2020 than you projected in 2019, that you'd be paying out in 2020, how can the impact to operating results be negative rather than positive? Because this is the impact uh, for the baseline scenario before we consider COVID impacts. The COVID impact you're talking about can be found in a, okay. we don't have these rows uh, labeled, but it's it's farther down the page, uh, I get just you. below the, the, the um, second subtotal. I get you. Thank you for, for, for that description. Um, then conversely, when you say that the projected impact of 2020 results is a plus 16%, not to harp on this, but how can it possibly be a pl plus 16% when you guys lost 40 million bucks? Um, so two reasons for that. Uh, one is this this is not the pension investment results. Uh, that flows through an entirely different accounting mechanism that I'm, I'm sure Ms. Green will be more than happy to elaborate upon. This has to do with the investments we make relative to the premium dollars that we, we take in um, relative to the cash flow of, of that those premiums in, those, the, the uh, claim payments out. Uh, so this is not pension investments, but other investments that we make as we maintain a certain level of, of, uh, of assets. Okay. But, but the, the pension money, okay, so, so you include, the, the pension money is on this, it just comes, it, it, we'll find out about it later on down in, the, uh, in this exhibit. Yes. Okay. Um, then uh, investment in Vermont Blue Advantage, that's a negative 20%. You see that? Yes, I do. Okay, and what's Blue Advantage? Uh, Vermont Blue Advantage is a is a brand new company that's going to begin offering uh, Medicare Advantage plans in Vermont in 2020. Okay. I'm sorry, and in 2021, I misspoke. And, and Medicare Advantage plans are not for people in the individual and small group market, correct? Correct. Okay, and so why should people in the individual and small group market be paying for Blue Cross to make an investment in a company that is not in the individual and small group market? That's an interesting question. Uh, we, you know, Blue Cross is looks to uh, provide quality products to all Vermonters. Um, there's been a lot of market demand for us to get into this space, and it's important for us as a going to concern to be able to invest in the types of new products that expand access to quality care for all Vermonters. Okay, and then the negative 6% on the next line, that's in a, what, what is that for? What's the new company that that goes to? Uh, that's, that's for Civica RX, uh, which Dr. McIntosh testified to. Um, Civicar RX is a is an innovative solution that's going to bring uh, lower cost generics uh, to the state and make them available to our policyholders. So that that's an investment. Again, it's a it's a really good example of an upfront investment that we need to be able to make in order to bring greater affordability a few years down the road. In this case, starting in 2022. Okay, and that's something that would benefit individual and small group policyholders. Correct? Yes, it will. Okay. Um, so you, 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 net out, you net out all those and you got a baseline uh, RBC as of December 31st, 2019 of 657, right? Uh, yes, that's right. Okay, then there are more adjustments, right? The equity market losses of a negative, of, of a negative 14%, again, that doesn't include the 40 million bucks. What is that? Uh, so again, that relates to those investment results that we talked about earlier. That's our that's our typical cash flow separate from the pension funding. Okay. Uh, and is uh, is a fourteen percent loss uh, equity market loss typical for Blue Cross? Uh, you'll have to ask Ruth Green that. She's our treasurer. She'll know that answer. Very good. Um, then there's a plus 42% for the acceleration of the AMT credits. And I believe I understand that the AMT credits were supposed to be spread out between 2019 and 2022, but you guys are getting it all in 2020, correct? 
that's my understanding. And is that is that about forty million bucks total? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, that's a bad question. Does the total do the total AMT credits uh, amount to about forty million dollars? Uh, that sounds about right to me. Yes. Okay, I see the two percent risk adjustment true up. I won't harp on that. The forty six percent that is for the uh, the risk harder litigation based on the Supreme Court's decision a few months ago, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, all right, and then and then you have this negative one, 180 based on the $40 million, which I've said enough about, but um, that, that's, what, that's what produces the 553, right? The, um, the, yes, that's the, right, it, it's part of the calculation. Sorry, the, the difference between the 657 and the 553 is because of the various adjustments between the 657 and the 553. Correct. Right. Okay. And then, so if you if you disregarded the 180 uh, percent hit to RBC because of the 40 million dollar investment loss, then what would Blue Cross's RBC ratio B. I'm going to object just to a to a word choice. Um, Mr. Angoff said investment loss, and I just want to be clear. I believe he's asking about the pension loss. Just to keep the record clear. Yes, I stand corrected. That's what I mean. If you if you disregard the forty million dollars in pension in the uh, if you disregard the forty million dollar investment with respect to the pension plan uh, and thus disregard the 180 percent drop in RBC, what would Blue Cross's RBC ratio be uh, in 2020 before COVID impacts on operations? Uh, doing a little quick math, it looks like 733 percent. Okay, and then with the um, the, the numbers uh, right below the 553 number, you've got there are different numbers, obviously for the different uh, the, the different scenarios that you assumed. Um, so that uh, so that means if we just look at that th those five numbers. Um, those five numbers are the estimate of the impact to RBC based on COVID-related claims and deferred care in 2020, correct? Specific to 2020, yes, that's right. Okay, so there's a positive 60% impact for no second wave, is that right? Yes. Okay, but only a positive 33% impact for suburban Southeast New York. Yes. And a 98% positive impact for Vermont. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, and thank you for your patience. I know this isn't riveting, but I want to make sure I understand all this. Um, it, the next set of adjustments are all COVID-related adjustments. Is that correct? The, 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 the adjustments before you get to the estimated RBC as of December 31st, 2020? Yes. Okay, and how did you, what, what methodology did you follow in determining those, th those impacts? So it, it kind of varies by item. Um, in terms of uncollectible premiums, I, I can give you a, a very brief overview, but um, uh, Ms. Green is the person responsible for this estimate. Uh, so we know that we have extended grace periods quite significantly uh, during the emergency. Um, we expect that a lot of those premiums will, in fact, never be paid. Um, and so we, we have a, a 21 point impact to RBC that's estimated here. Uh, the canceled, the next item is a six point impact due to the canceled recruitment of blueprint overpayments. Um, that one kind of is what it says it is. Uh, we were uh, going to recoup those overpayments from, from providers, but in light of the, the crisis that's ongoing, we decided to forgive um, that recruitment. It, it, um, 
if I can just try to shortcut this a little bit, um, sure. th th these, these are estimates or projections, right? There's no formula that you use to determine these numbers. There, there's no formula. These are, these are all uh, our best estimates of what the impact uh, is or is going to be. Based on actuarial judgment? Uh, in, in many cases, based on actuarial judgment. In some cases, based on uh, the blueprint number, for example, is reality. That's an actual number. Uh, the pharmacy number, uh, as another example, is a projection based upon the six months of pharmacy experience that we have to date. So we, we have some pretty good line of sight into how that pharmacy experience is emerging. So I, I would consider that and a number of these other items pretty solid projections. Okay, um, can you just go down to the last line before the footnote under key assumptions? You see there are two key assumptions? Yes. Okay, um, and the second one is no significant, no significant loss of membership due to economic downturn. Do you think that's a reasonable assumption? I do. We've, we've seen some small membership losses uh, to date, but we have not seen a, a what I would term a significant loss of membership at this point. Okay. And I, my final question for this uh, exhibit is, you see just the, the, you see in the line right above key assumptions, it says RBC as of May 31st, 2020, and then 695, you see that? I do. Okay. Does that 695 include the 180 drop because of the 40 million loss or exclude? Uh, again, I'll, I'll defer that uh, question to, to Ms. Green, uh, who will be able to, and I'm sure has the answer to that. I don't want to say the wrong thing, so we'll wait for her to give us the right answer. Very good. Um, you, you're familiar with uh, Oliver Wyman's conclusion that your projections here are somewhat conservative, right? I am. Okay. And you know that they say that, based on their analysis, that the net effect of the, uh, the impact of the coronavirus should be between 21 and 105 points positive. That is, RBC should increase by somewhere between 21 and 105 points, correct? I have seen that, yes. Okay. And you disagree with that? Completely. I believe Mr. Schultz and Mr. Chair and members of the board, you'll be pleased to hear that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Angle. All right. So we're going to move on to board questions. Um, start with member lunge. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hold on just one second. Hi, Paul. I hope you're doing well. Hi, Robin. Um, I am. Thank you. You too. So, um, on the, let me start with asking you about the Oliver Wyman um, estimate that we were just talking about. So you had testified earlier that the second version of the modeling in Exhibit 17 takes uh, out the conservatism. Am I remembering it, that correctly? It takes out any element of conservatism that we could find, um, yes. Okay, so didn't Oliver Wyman indicate that part of the conservatism was related to the deferred care assumption? They did. And um, your testimony today is that the 56% chart that's in Exhibit 6 is the correct chart. Is that right? So that chart is correct in terms of the returning care by line of service. Mm -hmm. uh, the 51.7% that's included on the chart in, I believe it's Exhibit 17, that 51.7% is the new overall assumption. Okay, so you, you, the modification you made was to drop that from 56 to 51%. I'm um, rounding. <laughs> it, it is. Um, it's really a function of math rather than a modification. Um, you know, as, as we included the June data, 
each of those 33 service categories had a different result in terms of the amount of deferred care. So when we did the, when we did the math on the new data, we come up with 51.7% rather than 56.1%. Okay. Thank you. Um, you, I think you heard my questions to Kate about the cost containment programs. Is are you the right person to ask about that, or should I direct those to Andrew? I I hope I can answer some of them. So let's let's give it a shot. Okay, great. So um, in the actuarial mem memorandum, which is Exhibit One, page thirty-seven, there is a discussion about cost containment programs that were delayed due to COVID which included programs that would reduce inpatient readmissions and reduce ED admissions. Um, uh, what I was hoping to understand was a little bit more in terms of the rationale for not resuming those programs at some point in 2020. It's a good question. I'm not in charge of those programs, so I'm not making those decisions. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, Mr. Garland may be able to give us some, some insight there. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask him about the home infusion program too, unless you can tell me the difference between uh, the program that was discontinued and how that's substantively different than a reduction in prior off. Yeah, so the my understanding of the program that was discontinued is that this was um, some uh, kind of positive outreach to try to encourage members to use more home infusion rather than traveling to the hospital. Um, so it's really that outreach um, that's been suspended to try to move those the site of that care from hospital to home. Uh, the prior authorization program is is something that's completely separate from that. Right, but wouldn't you expect the same result? That if there's no prior authorization, more people would get it? Um, good question, potentially. I, I've not studied that data myself, so I... Uh, I you know, I'd, I'd want to do so before uh, saying something conclusive about that. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm taking notes, which re which requires me to flip back and forth in my notebook. So, give me no one more moment. Um, and do you have any utilization statistics on the change in uh, home infusion over the course of COVID? I don't know. Okay. Is that something that you can get us, or do you think Andrew would have that? Um, I doubt I Andrew has that at his fingertips as well. Uh, so that's that's something that I can follow up with. Thank you. Okay. Um, so you uh, testified about... Um, Uh, that care was already returning to the hospital. Can you give us more specifics about what kind of utilization you're seeing? Um, so overall, we're seeing uh, our estimate of June utilization is about 5% above what we would expect based on historical norms. Um, and that- For what? I don't have all the numbers uh, at my fingertips by service category, but we've, we okay. definitely see some, sur some surgery service categories running at way over 100%. There are some surgical categories that have not returned yet to 100%. Uh, to my recollection, things like heart surgeries and lung surgeries are still pretty low. Uh, I, I'm not a practitioner, but I'm, I'm guessing that's because hospitals may still be grappling with how to uh, safely do those surgeries in a COVID environment. Um, but for a number of other service categories, uh, specifically related to surgeries, we're, we're way above 100%. Um, mental health is also pretty escalated. I don't think any of us will be surprised by that, given everything that's going on. Um, and I, while I've looked at kind of that full distribution by all 33 categories, those are kind of the ones that I'm remembering off the top of my head. Thank you. Um, so you also talked about how the change in membership did not create a change in the 2021 rate. Uh, 
Is that your testimony for the 2020 rates? Uh, for the 2020 rates, we did in fact uh, have a submit a higher increase than MVP. So using the same comparison, uh, you might be tempted to conclude that 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 the membership losses were driving the increase. Um, I my conclusion is a little different from that. I know that MVP in 20 and I'm not here to talk about MVP's filings. I'm not the expert in them, but I can say that MVP in 2020 submitted a utilization trend of zero. I know that was ordered to be increased as part of the process last year. Uh, so my professional actuarial opinion is that MVP included a, a utilization trend in last year's filing that was much too low. Um, I personally would not use a 1% utilization trend for this year either, uh, which is what they filed for this year's filing. Um, so if, if I were MVP's actuary, which I'm not, I, I don't think a 1% uh, trend is is reasonable. So I, I think their rate may be too low this year as well. So, uh, but the membership has impacted the morbidity of your population, has it not? It has impacted the morbidity. Yes, that's true. And we have adjusted for that in, in doing our utilization trend projections. This year or in only in prior years? I'm sorry? In this year or only in prior years? Uh, in this year and in prior years, we have consistently adjusted for morbidity changes in the population uh, when developing our utilization trend. Okay. Um, so in, on, in exhibit one, page 163, which is the TPR chart. Yes. There myself here. Uh, where it says approved contribution to reserve, these numbers don't reflect what the board approved. Isn't that right? That is correct. So these numbers you have adjusted based on uh, other changes that the board made in its order, assuming that those would fall to the CTR. Do I understand correct. that right? Yes, okay. you did. Thank you. Okay. Um, in terms of the investments in Blue Advantage, which which other markets are con contributing to the Blue Advantage program? That's a hard question to answer. I mean, it, all of um, the entirety of our book of business contributes toward our surplus and therefore toward our overall RBC. So, including self-insured plans. Yes, that includes self-insured plans. Okay, so it's it's not it's not as if we're you know we're not doing something as direct as saying okay we need to increase this rate by five percent for or half a point or whatever to pay for blue advantage right it's the, our surpluses are aggregated um, the the result of our aggregated operations over the entirety of the time that Blue Cross has been in business so when we decide to spend that surplus whether that's on uh, a new making a new product available. Um, so that we can improve access and quality for uh, a segment of Vermonters that we weren't able to serve before, or if that's for new programming that's going to make uh, the cost of care more affordable for all Vermonters, that comes from that entire amalgamation of 40 plus years of business that we've done. So yes, it's, it's all in there. If you want to think about who has contributed toward that, it's self-funded lines, it's these insured lines we're talking about today, it's large group insured, it's our Medicare supplement business, it's our investment performance over time, it's kind of all of those things intermingled. Okay, thank you. Um, in the administrative costs or cost to insurance estimates, uh, did you include any assumptions related to the federal requirement to provide a separate bill for abortion services? Um, we did not do anything explicit there, no. Okay, so there's no increase in your administrative cost relating to that requirement. That's correct. There is no increase. Thank you. That's good because it's not happening, so <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't want to charge for it. Um, okay, so I have some questions related to unit costs and items that are in the confidential portions of the exhibit. It might it makes sense, Mike, to hold those until all everybody else is gone, because I might not be the only one. That yes, that makes sense. Thank you. I meant our Mike. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Which exhibit, Robin? Uh, well, I have um, on page exhibit one thirty one. There is a, 
sentence that is confidential related to uh, fee schedules? Yeah, I think Mike, do you, you, you anticipate I'm, an executive session for Andrew Garland's testimony? I believe so. If if Bridget can chime in, Bridget has been working most directly with Andrew. You'd get a, a better answer from, from Bridget on that. Yes, we do anticipate an executive session for Mr. Garland. Okay, wh why don't we do it all? Yeah. That makes sense, because my questions may be for Andrew. I'm not sure. So that would that would be more efficient, I believe. Um, okay, then I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Okay, Maureen. Hi, Paul. Hi, Maureen. Um, a couple questions. Um, in the opening arguments and something that you've also touched upon, um, which is that your rates submitted have been lower than the competitors this year. So 6.3 yeah. versus 7.3. And one of the things I guess I want to look at, how, how do we think about the risk transfer adjustment? Because Prior to the risk transfer adjustment, the Blue Cross rate increase would be 7.7% and the MVP rate increase would be 6.1%. So basically, you have a higher rate request, I think, on the underlying rate than does MVP. But because there's an assumption that based on the risk transfer, I guess that you'll have unhealthier people and you'll pay more, uh, which is included in your rates, you get money back. Um, am I thinking about that wrong? I just want to make sure, you know, because I it was kind of a new approach for you guys to be, I think, looking at the competitor and what they're charging. And I tend to look at it prior to risk transfer um, as what the underlying rates are. And then the risk transfer is a separate adjustment and just wanted to get your point of view on that. Yeah, I, I think that's an appropriate way to view it. But the, while the risk transfer is a separate adjustment, it's very closely related um, to kind of that underlying amount that you talked about as well. In other words, the reason that our uh, increase without risk adjustment is higher than MVPs is because we have uh, the, we have all the, the folks who have the higher uh, healthcare needs. So really the risk adjustment program is working exactly as intended um, in as much as, you know, one carrier has much more of the unhealthier risk and the other carrier has most of the healthy risk, the risk adjustment transfer is supposed to net that out. So I, you know, I, I look at things myself as well before the, the risk adjustment transfer and I often see that we're having losses because claims are higher than I projected. But then the risk adjustment transfer comes in higher than expected as well and kind of washes that out. That's, that's the way those two things are supposed to work and it appears to be working that way in Vermont. Just to that, how then should that relate to premiums charged? So if, if in fact a risk transfer is kind of helping to set the market straight, right, wouldn't, wouldn't in theory and in perfect world, wouldn't then, you know, the risk transfer make the rates comparable on similar plans? So gold to gold, bronze to bronze, et cetera, you know, knowing there's a different mix of people and I'm not trying, I'm just saying, you know, to me, I thought that's part of what it's supposed to do. Um, and, and so why doesn't that happen? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And I've been spending a lot of time over the past couple of years trying to answer that question uh, for Blue Cross. So what, what we're seeing is that um, the morbidity differences between Blue Cross and MVP net of risk transfer are not really changing over time because that, that net increase that we're asking for is is very similar to what MVP is asking for. Um, and as, as I uh, responded to, um, to, to Robin Lunge, um, I think there are some other reasons why MVP's uh, rate requests have been a little bit lower than ours in past years, uh, specific to the utilization trend assumption. So when I think about risk adjustment, while the situation isn't really worsening, I do think there's an opportunity there and that if we were able to optimize risk coding, in other words, if, if um, doctors in Vermont were coding for every condition that a member has, but no conditions that a member doesn't have, so if risk coding were perfect, I do believe there's a, there's a pretty significant opportunity to increase that risk adjustment by as much as $10 million in terms of the transfer 
And if we were able to, to make that happen, that would bring our rates very much more in line with MVPs. So um, I, I am uh, uh, working um, with some of my teammates and others within the organization uh, on just that, to try to make that happen, because we believe the risk adjustment has not been really operating at 100% maximum efficiency and that there's some opportunity there. Okay, because I mean, it would be obviously good if our Vermont-based insurer could be you know, competitive with the you know, other insurers to, to you know, keep, keep that viable. When, when you talk about um, admin costs and, and you actually quoted, you know, something that was in the reports, you know, 90% lower than, you know, in the L&E report, um, again, you know, kind of all well and good, but when we look at in the state, right, and amongst the two filings that we have, you know, Blue Cross is, is over 12% higher on a PM, PM basis than what MVP is for an admin. And, you know, again, so we're kind of comparing, uh, you know, within our market, right? And there's different dynamics that go on there. And I know they're coming out of New York, et cetera. But, you know, how, how should we look at that? Because it's pretty significant to have, you know, such a high increase on a PM, PM base, high comparable on a PM, PM, PM basis. Um, so I first I'd say probably percent on a percent of premium basis is the more apt comparison to make. A lot of uh, administrative expenses are variable, and they are variable with respect to the number of claims. If, a, if uh, uh, members are not uh, uh, using an awful lot of care, they're uh, not calling the call center as much, we're not processing as many claims, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a whole line of, of sort of variable expenses that do fluctuate based upon the amount of care that's consumed. So for that reason, I, I personally would steer clear of PM, PM comparisons and look at it more in, in uh, relative to percent of premium. Um, beyond that, I'm, I'm not sure that I can give you any like key insights into, into MVP's administrative structure or how or why it might be any different from Blue Cross's administrative structure. Okay. Um, I'm going to look at uh, two charts. One, the Exhibit 1, page 163, that we've talked a lot about, which had the 12.6 million actual operating losses in the past six years. And I think you were adjusting it slightly for what you now know may be a little bit different. Uh, and so I think you were increasing it by maybe you know 2.8 million. So was that about right? So you're going to be about 15 million. And, and if I look at actually the last three years, um, including that additional change, it's it's been a net change of about I think a negative three million dollars. Um, yeah, I, I think that might be a, a little bit much. Again, I'm I'm doing math on the fly, which I'm I'm not supposed to be doing. But I, I think the risk adjustment uh, transfer true up was a little bit less than a million dollars, if I'm recalling correctly. Okay. Um, so that that 12.6 probably becomes something in the in the range of 13.5, 13.6, somewhere around there. Um, but yeah, apart from that clarification, I, I think your understanding of, of what we show in the chart is accurate. Okay. And then if we go to the exhibit six, page 59, um, you know, looking at, at the RBC and what's gone on there, um, would it be fair to say, or I guess I'll ask the question, you know, on average, um, you know, year over year on average, knowing there's ups and downs, but do you project investment gains? Do you expect yes. investment gains on average? Yes. Okay. Um, and the reason I point that out is because as we look at the number that you had for the for this last six years, and, and even if we make it the last three years, but for the last six years, I think it had a total of about a 70 point impact on RBC. Is that correct? In, in terms of the operating losses, or yeah, so twelve million dollars yeah. in operating yeah. losses has had about a about a sixty percent sixty points, and we would expect that we would have investment gains. So I just point that out because we hear a lot about what the Green Mountain Care Board has done to the rates, and you know here we have a six-year trend. We have a twelve million dollar loss, maybe it's a thirteen million dollar loss um, over six years. And we did expect, as a company, you would expect there would be investment gains that would offset that. So overall, I don't think that's that's too bad. I mean, I know there's puts and takes, but 
Well, I, I do want to point out, um, I, I think it's important to recognize that the one and a half percent CTR that we file um, assumes that we will have investment gains. So if we did not have investment gains, our required long-term CTR would not be one and a half percent, but something quite a bit higher than that. I, I can't sit here and do the math right now, but for sake of argument uh, or sake of illustration, I'll just say that might be three percent. But because of investment gains, we're able to bring that back down to one and a half percent. So I, I do think what we were showing in the earlier exhibit is a fair comparison um, because it shows what's happened from operations. We do expect some investment gains, but those investment gains are what allow us to file a CTR that's as low as one and a half percent instead of filing something much higher than that. And I, and I know last year we talked a lot about the you know AMT tax and what was going to happen and whether it was admitted or not admitted and, and all this went back and forth. But you know, at this point, when we look as of May, uh, we're reporting 695 for an RBC. When you look to the end of the year prior to the pension change, mm -hmm. it would be 733. And prior to any other COVID adjustments, which would put us near the top range of the 590 to 745. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not going to belabor the point at this point, but that, you know, the 180 basis point hit that's going to be expected for the pension. And from what I've been reading, it doesn't occur till 1231. So it's not in the May numbers. Um, you know, that 180 first contrasted to what we just said was a six year loss or six year change for, for um, this plan with the 60 basis points or 70 basis points. So just to kind of show the magnitude of what this 180 is going to potentially do to the um, to the RBC is, is huge. And I think the you know prior questioning you know is very relevant whether we say it impacts or not. It impacts. It's it's it, when this hits at the end of the year. If it's still 180, it will be 180 basis points reduction which will bring us now to the lower end of the range um, versus being quite healthy in the upper end of the range. So, you know, I'm sure there'll be some other questioning on this. I, you know, I know it wasn't what was expected to happen with this pension and, and there's going to be lawsuits and everything else going from this, but, you know, it, it, it's a significant burden and it's three times the size of six years of, of impact for what, what has been for the, um, you know, for this book of business. So yeah, I don't have the answer to it. I don't know what we do, but it certainly, you know, it certainly plays in to what's happening. And I'm sure it was a big surprise to everybody. And and uh, I'll just leave it at that for now. But, uh, but I do think it's pretty critical. Um, as we talk about the, and I, and I believe this is non-confidential, but you know, the hospital rates and what's what, what has been approved and then what rolled through this filing uh, specifically to Exhibit 21, uh, which was rates that um, had been submitted potentially uh, by, by UVM. I just want to get an understanding on what's included in the rates right now. Have we included just the prior um, hospital rate increases, or have we overlaid, I believe we have overlaid, I believe you've overlaid this increase in there, and can you talk to that? We have not included this increase. This is something that, uh, you know, the, the letter that's included in the exhibit uh, came to our attention well after the filing date. Um, okay. So what, what we included in the filing was simply an assumption that the commercial rate increases that were approved in 2020 were approved in 2019. It's hard for actuaries to keep our years straight sometimes. Sorry about that. That the commercial rate increases approved in 2019 would match the commercial rate increases that you're about to uh, approve in 2020. Okay. And we talk a lot about the rate increases and comparing. So when we're going to get new numbers in and the, and the rates, you know, inevitably won't be the exact same. And we, we, you know, look to, you know, you always look to adjust that and put that into your plans. How do you look at utilization and what the hospitals put in their budgets for utilization, which I think is, is equally as important for all their utilization assumptions? And I, I just want to get a handle on, you know, how, how do you guys look at, at that as well? Or, do, or can you? I mean, obviously their utilization is off all, all types and, you know, but, but still there are major assumptions that you have and major assumptions that they have. 
Yes, uh, so I, I do think hospitals' utilization assumptions are extremely important in terms of assessing their commercial rate uh, asks. Um, at, you know, especially given that we've already seen a huge deferral of care and we expect a lot of that care to return, I don't think it would be appropriate to include a 0% utilization in a hospital budget. Beyond that, um, and you kind of started touching on it, uh, Maureen, our, I believe that our utilization trend is the most accurate utilization trend specific to our business. Hospitals have to consider Medicaid, they have to consider Medicare, they have a whole host of patients that are well beyond just in our insured patients. They have to consider you know, state employees, Vermont teachers that are, that are part of self-funded programs. Um, so you know, it, it, is, it is not exactly an apples to apples comparison. Uh, uh, so I, I do think it's an important assumption and I, I'm glad that the board is, is, will be looking at that for hospital budgets as well. Um, but I also think that our assumption is, is the best assumption that we can use specific to the Blue Cross uh, utilization for Blue Cross members in these lines of business. Okay. And um, one last question on cost savings and cost containment. Um, you know, there, are, there have been things in prior filings, there are things in this filings, and there will be things obviously in future filings. And just really want to push on how much can we get from the cost savings and cost containment? I know, I believe it was last year, I think in some of the testimony, you know, when we put in 1% for affordability, it was like, well, we, we, we you know, if you told me in advance, that I needed that, I could get it, but you can't tell me in the current year. Something like that was, was yeah. stated, right? So, so how do we get, um, you know, maybe there's already some in for 21, there is, but how do we get that bigger in the future filings? You know, how can we say now, I want that to be two or 3%, you know, next year? I mean, what are we working on? What can we get and how, you know, how can we push that uh, harder? Yeah, I, I think having that guidance early from the Green Mountain Care Board as to what your expectation is um, will will help us uh, as we strive to implement this that some of that programming. Um, it it's not always an easy thing to implement some of those savings programs because we are often making trade offs. While we're enhancing affordability, we might do that um, by restricting in some way access to care, whether that's directing you know. If we think about some of the uh, cost differentials and so forth that exists within the hospitals, one thing we could do potentially is direct members who need a colonoscopy, for example, to one facility over another. Um, that could generate some savings, some of, some enhanced affordability, but at the cost of access. You can no longer drive this down the street and go to your local hospital to have this service. You might have to drive 45 minutes down the road, an hour down the road, something like that. Um, other programming that we're implementing has an impact on providers, and we often get an awful lot of pushback um, from providers when it comes to implementing that kind of programming. Um, so yeah, there, there are some things we can do. Uh, in this year's rates, we've included, as I testified, about $5 million worth of savings through Blue Cross uh, programs. That $5 million is, is going to be uh, something like maybe 1.7% or so. Uh, of total premium. So that's that's a pretty good number. We've, we've already included that. And if you tell us now that we expect you to include uh, some number, 1% uh, has been your affordability cut in the past, 2%, whatever that number may be, um, I, I think that would be helpful for us as we try to take strides to actually achieve those savings and incorporate them into the premiums. What we can't do is, is as, you, as you alluded to, we can't react immediately. So if you tell us now, we need you to achieve an extra 1% in savings through this programming by next year, there's just not enough time to develop and implement a program by the start of 2021 to achieve that savings in 2021. If you told us right now, we expect you to achieve an additional point of savings in 2022, then that gives us enough runway to actually figure out how to do it, if you will. And you could exceed your savings as you have this year. I think you had exceeded in, in one, some of the commentary, you exceeded how much you thought you would get. So I guess, are you, are you conservative in what you roll in there for these estimates? We, it's a good question. We, we try not to be. Uh, sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to um, project exactly how much savings we're going to see. Uh, some of the programming that we had in, uh, in the last few filings 
um, isn't, gonna isn't going to lead to the type of savings we had estimated um, for large part because we've had to suspend a lot of those activities due to the pandemic. So sometimes things come to fruition, sometimes they exceed what we thought they were. The lab benefit manager is a good, uh, is a good example of one that's actually worth more than what we thought. So while we had something in our rates last year for it, we actually achieved something greater and that delta flows into this year's rates. So that, that you know the savings that we're including as part of that $5 million in this year's rates are on top of the savings that we already assumed that we were going to achieve in last year's rates. It's all cumulative as we go along. Okay. That's all for my questions. I'm sure I have some others, but I'm sure the other board members will address those as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to board member Pelham. Hi, hey, Paul, how are you? Morning, Tom, I'm quite well, how are you? Are you holding up okay? I, I am holding up okay, yes, thank you. So I, I, I wanna start with just a little bit of housekeeping, um, just to be sure. I wanna go back to uh, exhibit 23. Okay. And that was the uh, Kaiser chart? Yes. And just, um, so at, at the top of your version of it, um, you where you've added Blue Cross Blue Shields profile, it says individual slash merged market medical loss ratios. And then when you click on the link, it says average individual mark, um, market medical loss ratios. So I'm just wondering, is this an apples to apples comparison? Uh, did you put in, insert the merged market to make it clear that in Vermont it's a merged market, but are these numbers nationally just for the individual market? They are just for the individual market. And I, I do think that's the best basis of comparison relative to our merged market. Uh, when CMS issues various reporting about how the markets are performing, whether that's related to MLR rebates or anything else, um, the Vermont merged market is included with all the individual market reporting. So I, I do, you know, it's as, as you point out, it's not a precise comparison. Um, but I, I think it's the best comparison that we can make. Right. I mean, especially it's hard to find national data. So, I mean, uh, just, found, just, just found that chart and sent it around to us, uh, you know, months ago, you know, and uh, I kind of uh, um, have had it at the back of my mind. Um, hang on a minute. Did I lose you? I'm still here. Oh, okay. So um, I just want to start again by um, just you know, for me, kind of finding a path between kind of the look back trending actuarial approach and the kind of the look forward um, <clears throat> uh, all payer model uh, uh, approach because there there is a tension there. And, um, you know, I've kind of aligned myself just in terms of my, my board work with the three and a half percent target because I know where that comes from. That comes from you know, Jeff Carr and Tom Gavette's analysis of the gross state product from uh, 2001 to 2016, and that's where that 3.5% came from. So it's it's grounded um, in the Vermont economy, and obviously things change. The economy's, you know, uh, taken a bit of a, a wear and tear in the last uh, few months, but it's it's a number. And so the first year in, in the um, – uh, that we have the uh, APM total cost of care for 2018, we're at 4.1%. So we're still within those guardrails around the 3.5%, but I worry that 19, 20, 21, um, especially reading letters like Todd Keating's, you know, that, um, you know, we are, um, you know, we we are not going to get where we want to go. So, um, so um, but I, I do want to say that um, in terms of the Wyman uh, data, you know the that those numbers tie out um, uh, precisely in terms of um, the, the net gains to what's in your audited financial statements and and what's in the um, uh, um, supplemental health care exhibit. So I feel comfortable uh, in that. And they 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 do say, and I, I um, they they do if you kind of add them up um, um, over from the 2015 to 2019 period, pick whatever venue you want. You end up with a uh, a total gain of uh, 16.8 million dollars over those five years, um, with uh, um, 
<clears throat> with with losses, let's see, net, accru net income accruing in three years and losses in two years. So I, I raise that just because I run into people and say, hey, it's these insurance companies, they've got all the money, just whack, you know, and it's just popular out on the street there. You know, and I kind of want to agree with them in some ways, just, you know, emotionally, but that's it, it, that, it's not there, um, I don't think. Um, but I do think that you can find savings. No budget is perfect. Marine says that all the time. It's a, it's a, um, it, it, it changes from the minute it's been approved. And, you know, I've found that in my experience. There's always two or three percent you can find if you push a little bit. And there's some screaming, but um, uh, it's, it's there. So, um, so I want to go to um, the... Uh, um, the quote, and I think it's in exact. I'm not going to go search my binder. I, I think I, I just hope my notes are good here. It's in an exhibit uh, one, page 31, where you say observations of recent contracting and provider budgetary changes are the main source of unit cost trend. And further, you say 53% of the total medical claims occurred in Vermont facilities and providers impacted by the hospital budget review process of the Green Mountain Care Board. And, you know, I, I can look at data that we have um, in terms of hospital budgets and stuff and kind of get and even commercial insurance, you know, uh, you know what what that is in terms of revenues to hospitals. But I'm just wondering if you if, and if you're not the right person, that's fine. If you can you dig a little deeper on that um, uh, on, on that 53 percent and kind of uh, how the entities that comprise that 50 percent how their input to it is weighted relative to one another. I mean, is um, is there a weighting system that goes on when you're kind of looking at the trends of those entities? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it's and then the the weights that we use are the the claims that our members incur at those entities. Um, so as you might imagine, University of Vermont Health Network is the is the strong majority. Uh, uh, you know, by far the biggest entity. Mm -hmm. Um, within there, I, I don't. I don't know that they're a majority of the 53%, but I, I could uh, get that data and, and share that with yeah. you and your fellow board members. Right. So that I, that I can tell you in terms of uh, NPR and in terms of overall commercial revenue, um, they are more than a majority. Um, I mean, I, we, we have those numbers here. The uh, you know the number um, for 2019 was. Total commercial revenue at hospitals was $1.395 billion, and uh, um, the network was 54% of it. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 but it's just something to, 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 to ponder. Um, so, my next question is that, that the trends that you look back on are trends that Blue Cross Blue Shield has had a hand in negotiating. I mean, earlier you said, you know, that we look back into our database and you obviously have a database about claims um, and that's part of your trend. But it's it's not that it's entirely, the, the, the trends that you look at are not entirely kind of a free market independent uh, process. So you, you, you are part of the process of negotiating those trends. Um, that, that's a yes or no answer, I guess. Uh Yes, and I think uh, Andrew Garland will testify at length about that process. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just ask the question now, but I'll ask it to him later. Is is just, um, you know, it, 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 there's another quote, and I'll I'll, I'll say it you know, from last year, where they basically say that, you know, that with some providers, you kind of run up against a brick wall, and it's either give them what the Green Mountain Care Board approved, or they uh, won't, they, they might withdraw from your network. That was the testimony, you know, uh, last year. And so I'm just wondering, um, you know, it, it, you know uh, uh, about that process um, uh, and trying to kind of get more to the all, all pair model result um, is that, and, and I'll ask, ask uh, Andrew this, but it seems to me that kind of the message is Green Mountain Care Board you do the heavy lifting here. You set the constraint, uh, and and uh, you know constraint. So um, anything over that constraint uh, is uh, uh, is going to be a, a kind of a 
a negotiating item between the insurer uh, and, and the provider. If, if I may, Board Member Pelham, I apologize. I just want to remind Mr. Schultz that the question veers towards um, confidential uh, areas of testimony about provider negotiations, and I would just caution Mr. Schultz, since yeah. we're in open session, not to reveal any such information. Yeah. And there, there will likely be an executive session yeah. you know, where, where we can go into that more depth later. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's why I reference data that you know comes out of our system, you know, in terms of the uh, you know you know commercial payments in, in, in 2019. Um, so. Um, and this might not be a question for you, but it, in the 2019 Supplemental Healthcare Exhibit, uh, it indicates a $1.63 million expenditure for cost containment. What Do you know what that is? What that goes to I, directly? I, I do not. Uh, Ms. Green will, will most likely be able to answer that question for us. Okay, provider negotiations. Central benefits we covered. Cost shift, thank you. I was going to ask that question and your attorney beat me to it, but I wasn't going to ask I wasn't I wasn't going to ask the question uh, uh, that you did answer on um, the difference between the QHP operating loss and the uh, supplemental health care underwriting. I wasn't going to ask that one, but I got the answer anyhow. Um, administrative charges, um, provider network, uh, just one question on the loss ratio. Um, I mean, you can go back through history and look at loss ratios. Um, I think for some of your portfolio near the beginning, um, it's on a sticky here somewhere. But you were you were down in the you know for for it might have been individual claims, it might have been um, um, small group in like the high 80s, um, um, going back four or five years. And I'm just wondering if if there were a um, a more um, aggressive uh, approach toward provider budget increases um, and and therefore claims costs could be driven down a little bit, you know, that could fall to the benefit of ratepayers. Um, it's it's uh, because, you know, and say, staying kind of at the same ratio, uh, that, that could fall to the benefit of ratepayers. Yes, I, I agree. And as much as uh, hospital um, uh, reimbursements are lower, that definitely benefits ratepayers. And the same is true, you, you, you alerted, alluded a little bit earlier to, you know, if we're able to, to trim budgets by two or three percent. Um, with respect to the premium rate, it, we need to understand that two to three percent is means we're paying providers two to three percent less, right? right? That's, you know, Blue Cross's admin portion of the premium is very small, so we can't right. find two to three percent of total premium there. We're talking about right. paying providers less. But that's right. I mean, that's why I raised the, the Wyman data because I, I think there might be something there in admin, things of that sort, but it's not where you're going to find the money to really substantially impact uh, um, uh, premium rates. It's, it's, it's in the, it's, it's as the money comes out of ratepayers' pockets, goes through you guys and out to the real world. Um, you know, that, that's where this option is. And so I, I just was trying um, in my simplistic way to get a sense of what we're talking about here. And so this is my simple math, and uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you look at uh, what was filed for 2021, it was a $311 million increase or a $311 million premium amount, um, uh, which is uh, 18.5 million above the $292 million number uh, projected in those uh, um, um, in small group and individual for, um, for you know for this year. So it's an eighteen million dollar delta, um, and if you divide that by the original six point three four percent increase, that's two point nine three two two million uh, two point nine three million dollars per point. And so you're now at five point five percent. If uh, if the target, my target were 3.5 percent, you could say to me, "Go find it, Mr. Pelham." Um, <laughs> but that would, that, but that would be uh, two uh, million. I mean, two times the 2.93 million, or 5.8 million dollars. So that's what that to get down to a, a 3.5 percent level, we're talking about 5.8 million dollars in the system. Um, that that might be in, impacted on 
uh, pr pr providers out there in the world, you know, uh, mostly the hospitals. Is that a rational logic? <laughs> so uh, it is. Um, a, a couple okay, key points there. there that <laughs> uh, there are, are a couple key differences between the all payer model and what we're putting in our rates. Uh, most notably is that the all payer model target uh, doesn't include pharmacy. So our, our rates, you know, as I testified, 3.7% of that increase is due to specialty pharmacy. Yeah. So if if we, you know, now some of specialty pharmacy granted is takes place with as part of the medical benefit. So that would be part of the three and a half percent target. Um, it especially is about 50-50 in terms of retail pharmacy uh, versus medical benefits. So if we take out half of that 3.7, we're talking about a little under 2% that's specifically due to specialty pharmacy. Uh, retail pharmacy is also escalating. Well, retail pharmacy is mostly escalating because of specialty pharmacy, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, kind of the other key difference is that that 3.5% includes all payers, at, as the title suggests, right? So it's Medicare, it's Medicaid, and it's commercial payers. And have we seen, as we've seen year after year after year in the hospital budget submissions, there is inevitably a cost shift from Medicare and Medicaid to commercial players. So I, even if we as a state achieved the three and a half percent, I would be astonished and in a really good way if that three and a half percent came from three and a half percent from Medicaid, three and a half percent from Medicare, and three and a half percent from commercial. Uh, what's been the experience in Vermont and what I would expect to happen is something that's more like a very low number, zero to something very small for Medicaid, uh, again, a very low number for Medicare, and then the commercial increase becomes the balancing item. So we might be at zero, one, and six by way of example, just using some really rough, rough illust illustrative estimates. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm not sure that there's a scenario where we actually get the, because of the, because we include prescription drugs and because of the, you know, the, the prevalence and cost escalation of the specialty pharmaceuticals, but also because of the cost shift, it's hard to foresee a situation where, where a commercial rate increase would be as low as three and a half because the Medicare and Medicaid increases are unlikely to be as high as three and a half. Yeah. Well, I mean, those are those are very good points. And when it comes to the pharmacy specialty, and I have no no good ideas. I mean, it just seems a world out beyond our borders, you know, that 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 can't be, um, you know, adjusted or manipulated. But I think in terms of, and I agree with you on the all payer model, the three and a half percent to some extent. Um, but keep in mind that increases in Medicaid don't count uh, during this period. Don't count to the total cost of care. Uh, because the the agreement exempts them basically, so the what drives the three and a half percent is the uh, is the commercial um, and, and and the Medicare. So um, you know, and so when I when I kind of um, I had another point to make there, but hopefully it will come back. But when I, when I kind of look at kind of follow the money over the last five years. And it and I see that the UVM Medical Center, not the network, but the, the UVM Medical Center itself, uh, over the last five years, uh, uh, up through 2019, accrued 295.8 million of the operating margin of 329.2 million, and uh, we have other hospitals that are hanging on by their fingernails. Something seems possibly awry to me. In as the money comes out of ratepayers' pockets, goes through the insurance system, negotiations happen with these providers, and it and and the flow of the money is heavily weighted. I mean, 89%. You can do the math on that February 26 uh, um, notation that was in my letter to you folks. Um, that seems to me a place where um, the board might be helpful, giving well. The board might be helpful in 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 setting some some boundaries that um, aren't up in the six, seven, eight, and nine percent world. Um, so um, there was one more thought I had. And oh, um, in terms of the cost shift, and again, this is this is outside your domain, but uh, you know, in terms of looking at it, 
you know, um, uh, where might we find more Medicaid money, you know, or where could we have found more Medicaid money to maybe balance the scales a little bit? Because if Medicaid does contribute more, then the cost shift might be nullified on you guys a little bit, certainly not the 16% or whatever it is. And so as you, as, as you follow the big items in at DIVA's Medicaid budget um, through the third quarter of the state fiscal year 2020, they had only spent, and it was adjusted downward in the legislature's budget adjustment, they had only spent 63% of their appropriation. Uh, and But we are three quarters of the way through the year. There are tens of millions, and this has been going on year after year after year as the, as the economy rose. And when I was finance commissioner, I saw the reverse of that. You know, it gets pretty scary when it's going the other way. But, um, you know, but but there's opportunity there, um, I think. Um, you have Doug Hoffer's audit of Dr. Dinosaur, where he found that people were um, not paying their premiums, but still getting Medicaid benefits. And just the small sample he used was $2.3 million. That's, um, you know, and... Uh, you know, you have the fact that Dr. Dinosaur premiums um, are lower today than they were in 2004. Think about that. And that's because they were taken out of the legislative domain and put into um, uh, the um, uh, the the uh, agreement agreement with the feds, the waiver, waiver, 1115 waiver agreement. So there are options out here if we think beyond this process. Um, and um, but within this process, you know, I, I think it's an important uh, venue for us to set expectations, you know, that it's 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 not just the insurers have an obligation and the board has an obligation, but other players um, have an obligation or we're not going to be successful, you know, with, with the agreement that that we've we've uh, you know, the journey that we're on. So um, that's more my rant than my questions, but. Um, <laughs> I, I I just think it's important that that we can be here and worried about all these kind of you know in the weeds about all these these, these technical issues and I'm certainly glad to go there but um, I, I'm just not quite sure what what it will get us in the long run in the big picture. Okay, Board Member Holmes. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess we all are asking you the same question, Paul. How are you doing? <laughs> all feeling it, right? I'm, and I was, I'm doing I all right. I was, I'll be happy for that next break. <laughs> yeah, and I was thinking about, I think this happened to me last year, but I've always said I don't teach classes before or after lunchtime because before lunchtime, everybody's starving and they just want to get out. And after lunchtime, they have a food coma. Yeah. And here it is, 12.41. So bear right. with me. Uh, I know I'm the only thing between you and lunch. Actually, Chair Mullen has to go too. But um, thank you for, for bearing with all of our questions. Um, and as a quick thought in reference to Maureen's, uh, you, you made a comment to Maureen, if you can give us a longer runway, we can achieve some cost savings. And so tell us by 2022. So here's your runway. By 2022, we got to get these premium growth rates to, you know, at the, the wage growth in the state of Vermont. So if you need that runway, <laughs> I'm here, I am giving it to you. But anyway, that's an aside. Can you just turn to um, exhibit one, page 33? If you would, I'm there. Okay, perfect. I want it's at the bottom chart, and you're talking about um, the you know since 2014 implementing new programs to combat fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, it in, you know those programs increased rapidly over that time period. You were able to recover more claims, and in 2018, you recovered you know 1.42 percent claims. The migration to a new platform slowed it down in 2019. And then you talk about due to COVID-19, you've stopped those programs and it's unclear when they will start again. Um, so my question is around that, why? And, and I understand that you may not be the answer, you not, may not be able to answer the why question, but if you could answer the why question, I'd really appreciate it because it does seem to have an impact um, on, you know, on rates and on affordability, having those, you know, those programs in place. So how yeah. has COVID-19 stopped the FWA programs? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not uh, particularly closely involved with that decision, but my understanding is that because providers have so much on this on their plates right now, responding to the pandemic, 
that we're trying to ease the burden on them in other ways. Uh, we, we suspended some prior auths, and we've also made the, made the decision to suspend uh, fraud, waste, and abuse activities just to, to ease that burden on providers during this difficult time. Okay. Um, so let me follow up a little bit with that. So now we know that, for example, you know, utilization is, has increased above capacity. So to the degree that we'd want to really be vigilant about fraud, waste, and abuse, now would be the time perhaps even more so, recognizing that should there be a second surge or something like that, we may want to cut back even, you know, providers are dealing with a pandemic. But given the levels of infections that we have now and the increased utilization that we're seeing, it seems like now would be the time to, to think about reinstating those programs. And I just, can you, if you can turn to exhibit six of page 59, I want to be able to understand this. It looks like to me, um, this is where we're looking at RBC. Um, it looks like to me the impact of suspension of those audit activities has a RBC reduction of 19%, which is actually greater than the projected impact of 2020 operating results of 17%, right? So, I mean, the, the magnitude is not insignificant. It's in the notes, it talks about claims will be about $4 million above projections because of the suspension. So, I guess what I would ask is actuarially, if you return to the 2018 levels, for 2021, what would the impact be on the premium rate change? Ooh, that's an interesting question. That makes me makes me think about my actuarial work a little bit. Um, so we we did not assume in this rate filing that that FWA would go away. Um, we assumed that um, that it that it would maintain at the at the pre-COVID levels. So we, we did make some adjustments in coming up with our utilization trend to, to uh, adjust for the fact that it's kind of varied over time. But we did not assume in this filing that those FWA activities would go away and would continue to be gone for 2021. Um, my understanding is that we've, we've agreed to suspend those activities as long as the emergency order is, is in place. Um, beyond that, I can't really speak to the timing of, of when we think those activities will come back. Uh, but we do expect to resume them um, at, at the, at the, well, my expectation is that they will have resumed by 2021, I guess would be my best way of putting that. Well, if you turn to page 34, just the next page, it says you assume that the percentage of claims recovered through these programs will remain at approximately three quarters of percent of total mm -hmm. claims, right? So you're assuming the same level in 2021 as in 2019, which is below the 2018 level. Right. I guess what I'm asking is, if you went back to the 2018 level, mm -hmm. what would the input be? And maybe you uh, can answer later if, if that's helpful. Or I don't no, know. that's okay. Uh, so you know, we're we're talking about the you know the delta from 2019 to 2018 uh, looks like about 0.65 percent of claims. Yeah. Uh, premium, as we know, is not exactly equal to claims. So there's you know we do have some other items that are in there as well, um, and that'll be on medical claims only. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of talk through the answer rather than giving you a precise answer, but we're, we're probably talking about something that's, that's less than a half a point on premiums. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I know my colleague Robin asked you about the why um, cost containment programs were suspended. I'm not going to ask you the why. I know she'll ask Mr. Garland later, but I guess I did want to ask, I, I did want to say, um, again on exhibit one, page 14, it talks about the claims experience for 2019. This is in the first paragraph under 1.5. Um, claims experience for 2019 was very slightly favorable relative to the expectation embedded within the 2020 filing, driven by a 1% improvement due to you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield's cost containment programming that exceeded expectations. So we know that the programming has an impact um, on claims um, and on, you know, cost containment. It seems to be working, at least according to that. So I guess my question to you would be actuarially, <laughs> trying to keep the actuarial questions for you, if cost containment programming was the same as it had been prior to uh, the platform being uh, introduced and prior to COVID-19, what would the reduction be there in premium growth rate? 
if we so were there, there wouldn't actually be one here. The 1.3% that we're referring to in this paragraph has to do with the lab benefit manager that Dr. Okay. McIntosh discussed. Um, and those savings are, well, the savings that took place are included in the filing, and we're assuming that those savings will continue into the future as well. In fact, we're assuming that the lab benefit manager will be able to hold lab utilization to zero, to no increase at all um, as we move forward in time. So that those particular savings are most definitely already in here. Okay, so do you know, I'm not asking you the why, but of the programs that were suspended, if they were resumed, what would be the impact? Do you have any sense of that? I, I don't think there would be an impact. Those That okay. programming um, will have already manifested itself in the experience, like in the claims experience we use to develop this filing. Okay. So by resuming them and allowing them to continue, we we would we would assume that that would you know we would assume that the impact that they had in the claims experience will continue to be the impact that they have in the future, and so um, again I I would not make an adjustment for that, okay. um, assuming we turn them back on before 2021. Okay. Um, I had similar questions to Maureen about the admin costs. Um, in terms of per member per month, you know, it is a stark difference per member per month. And I recognize that you would prefer to look at it as a percent of premium. But, you know, whenever we can, it's nice to see an apples to apples comparison, right? And when we look at two competitors in the same market with in the same state with roughly the same size member population, that seems like the best apples to apples comparison one could possibly make. And there is a significant difference in the per member per month uh, administrative charge. And so I, I, I know you've already tried to answer that. I'm not going to, you know, ask it again. But I, I would just point out that it, you know, on a per member per month basis, it's very difficult to see that huge difference and not think what is underlying that. Um, so I don't know. If you, I will give you the opportunity to just comment. But if you just want to say it's better to look at percent premium. I will. Well, I, I, I do think because of the variable costs that are involved, it makes more sense to look at the at the percent of premium. Okay. Um, a second, an, another question is, you know, we've talked a lot about the COVID-19 impact and a lot of modeling, and I appreciate all the modeling that's been done. Uh, I know how very difficult that is, so many different assumptions, so many different ways at which you could uh, tackle that. Obviously, the impact can be positive, negative, depending on whether it's the second wave, what we think about with deferred procedures, the cost of vaccines, cost of treatments, all of that. But one of the things that seems to me to be uh, more predictable is the fact that telemedicine is probably here to stay, right? Mm -hmm. And not going away. And we know that there are studies that are showing there's significant cost savings associated with, as we have more telemedicine, ED visits go down, um, you know, urgent care visits go down, which are very costly. And your own modeling talks about a 14% reduction in utilization um, related to that telemedicine in those ways. So I'm wondering why not carry that forward? Because that doesn't necessarily depend on how many cases we have, whether there's a surge, what the treatment costs of COVID are. That's a change in demand that's happening because provider and consumer behavior has changed. So why not factor that in? to your assessment of costs and utilization? Uh, we did. Um, we, yeah, okay. we have a, a, a section in, in, the, uh, in the memo, and I believe we repeated it in the addendum. Uh, we are assuming that ER and urgent care utilization will, will never return to pre-COVID levels. Um, that assumption is, is kind of belied by emerging June experience. We'll see how that continues to develop. But it looks like, uh, based on what we know today about June, that that ER and urgent care utilization did return to pre-COVID yeah. levels. That's a surprising result to me, but we ignored that for purposes of the modeling, and we did include uh, an ongoing reduction of about 14% in ER and urgent care utilization in recognition of the of the increase in use of telemedicine and so forth. Perfect. I thought you had modeled it, but I didn't realize you had included it. So that is a great answer to my question. Um, Looking, I'm looking at all of my notes as well. So is there, and this may be a question for Ruth, but uh, I'll ask you anyway, and you can tell me if it's more of a question for Ruth. Are there legal limitations on how CTR might be used? So 
you know, CTR is largely meant to cover medical costs, unexpected medical losses, things like that. But to the extent that, you know, if Blue Cross Blue Shield, let's just say, wanted to build a new building, um, new office building, or wanted to do something, would it come out of CTR? And are there any limitations? Is there any minimum that has to be kept in CTR to cover medical losses? Um, so it, it's a good question. It's a complex answer, and, and Ruth will probably be able to elaborate it. But you know, DFR as our solvency regulator keeps close tabs of how we're spending our surplus, what we're doing with it. They, have, for example, um, for Vermont Blue Advantage, which we we've, we've touched on in a little bit, um, that all had to be approved by DFR before before we spent that money and took that step. Um, so I. I think I'll kind of leave my answer there. Uh, That's it's probably fine. just a starting point, and, and Ruth will probably be able to elaborate on that. Okay, great. Um, my last question is actually, this is more of a curiosity, but I just recently read that there are a bunch of um, new uh, reports that premature births have plummeted as a result of COVID-19, and they can't figure it out why, but it's happening in different countries, and it's it's a very, very significant drop in premature births, and they're trying to unpack it and figure out why. So I'm just, this is a curiosity question, but obviously premature births are extremely expensive, and I'm wondering if we're seeing that, if you're seeing that, is this even a topic of conversation at Blue Cross? That is fascinating. I was unaware of that. Um, I and I, I'm interested to go back and look at our own data. Our, data. Uh, our birth rate in Vermont, Vermont is not, is not so high, high, but we might have really good data on it. Um, cause you know, just one or two premature births will really throw that, that percentage around when we're talking about a small population like Vermont, but that, that's, that's really interesting. And I, I look forward to, to looking at our own data to see if we can find that here too. Yeah. Okay. That was a curiosity. Thank you. I have some other questions that I think probably will, you know, go towards executive sessions. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think I'm probably not the only one who needs a bathroom break. So why don't we take five minutes, come back <laughs> to the chairs, questions, uh, potential redirect. I would just say we're, again, despite the pre-file testimony behind where I was hoping to be at this point in the hearing. So um, just be aware well, of uh, that we have so two Mr. more. Wouldn't it be more efficient if you combined your bathroom break with lunch break? It would. Save five minutes. Sure, we can do that. Do you want to go ahead and ask questions? Oh, I, I was just saying that it'd be nice just to have one break. I don't have to ask my questions now if people are crossing their legs, but <laughs> I'll leave it to you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Does anyone need a five minute break? No, nope. everyone's good. All right, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Schultz. Um, Good afternoon, Chair Mullen. Er earlier this morning, you um, testified uh, that retail pharmacy was cutting into margin and thus into reserves. But isn't it true that Blue Cross made several changes to make it better for Vermonters facing the pandemic by, um, I believe, in some cases, allowing for 180 day fills and things like that? Yes, uh, suspension of uh, early refill edits, those sorts of things. Yes, that's true. So wouldn't you begin to see some savings from that since they won't need to get those medications over the next few months? Yeah, for the, for the most part, we're talking about 90-day fills, and those, those programs were implemented generally in the late March or early April timeframe. So if we look at data through June, um, we, we will have seen sort of the full ebb and flow of that as, as, as scripts were filled in early April for 90 days, they don't have to be filled again until July. So I, I do think that we um, we were able to assess that fairly by looking at data uh, all the way through June. Okay, thanks. Um, last year you testified um, about uh, some savings that could occur, it may have been the year before, time runs, runs by me now. <laughs> Um, through the opening of the ASC. Have those um, estimated savings come to reality? Um, I, I honestly haven't looked at those data. Um, so that, that's something I'd be happy to follow up on. Okay. Um, 
Sometimes it, it's, uh, as Yogi Berra would say, it's uh, deja vu all over again, or, or maybe I feel like I'm in Groundhog Day, but um, you testified that um, really a lot of the um, orders that gr the Green Mountain Care Board has offered in the past were really just a, a reduction um, to reserves. And you also made the statement, and I know that one member followed up on that, that um, you said, um, if you want us to achieve savings, um, tell us to do it in 2022. Why does the Green Mountain Care Board need to tell Blue Cross Blue Shield to try to be efficient? You don't. You don't. I mean, and I, I think we have lots of evidence for that in this filing and in previous filings. We've saved over $5 million for Vermont ratepayers through the actions that we took relevant to this filing. The number, I think, was quite a bit bigger than that last year. Uh, these are things we continue to work on. We work on all the time. Um, and so when, you know, when we already include those amounts, those savings in our filing, um, what becomes really difficult is when we're then told, go find 1% more, and by the way, go do it within the next four months. That, that's just not practical. So that, that's the point that I was trying to make. Do you believe that Blue Cross has a responsibility to Vermonters to operate efficiently? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, do you believe that Blue Cross is doing everything that it possibly could to be as efficient as possible, offering um, prevention programs that would have a, an ROI um, in the, in the uh, future and things like that? That's uh, that's maybe not a question for an actuary. Uh, what I what okay. I can tell you is that you know we we don't have carte blanche to just do whatever we want. Um, there's often pushback from providers. Uh, in some ways, some of those programs that, in, it, that improve affordability also restrict access. And so there's, there's pushback from legislators uh, and there can be pushback from members. So, you know, we, we can't just go out and implement everything we possibly want to in order to reduce the cost because there are a lot of trade-offs and a lot of interested parties uh, that want to have a say in those matters. But you'll admit that there could be some things that Blue Cross could do that could make it more efficient. I, I don't know that more efficient is the phrase that I would use. There are steps Blue Cross could take to make things more affordable, whether Vermonters or whether the Green Mountain Care Board want us to take those steps and whether providers are willing to help us take those steps may be a different question altogether. Okay. Um, in the uh, testimony um, by Dr. McIntosh, there was a lot of questioning and I'm not sure this may not be for you and it may be for, for Ruth, but again, um, we were trying to get to the percentage of the more expensive hospitalizations that are carried through the exchange product as opposed to Medicare. We know that um, there's a much older um, age um, demographic when it comes to uh, hospitalizations in this disease, Medicaid and um, third-party administered uh, plans. Um, has any calculation been done as to what percentage of these more expensive hospitalizations relate specifically to the QHB? I don't have the specifics related to hospitalizations. What I can say is that Blue Cross has spent $4.4 million on COVID-related costs uh, so far this year. Okay. I believe that you said earlier that um, you do not have any involvement in either um, investments as far as reserves or in pension. Is that correct? That is correct. Who are the um, people directly involved at Blue Cross Blue Shield who make those decisions? Uh, Ruth Green is our CFO and treasurer, and she will have the most insight into that process. Okay, I'll save those questions for Ruth then. Um, did you um, do any type of review or have any input into the letter that uh, Mr. George sent to us um, in the latter part of June regarding the pension loss? No, I read the letter. That was the extent of my involvement. No editing or no? Correct, I was not part of that process. Okay. Likewise, uh, back in March, um, when um, we certainly were not aware of it, but you reported to DFR, according to press accounts, 
that this problem had occurred. Did you have any involvement at that time in that reporting to the Department of Financial Regulation? None. Okay. Those are all my questions. Everybody can go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair Mullen. Not quite. Um, <laughs> now we go to opportunity for redirect for Mr. Nafrio. I have no questions. Thank you. Okay. Now we can go to lunch. Um, I was hoping to take an hour, um, but it seems like that may be too long given that we have two more um, Blue Cross witnesses, the commissioner, which I imagine you guys will have some questions for, uh, l and &E, and then Mike Fisher. So, so I'm thinking half an hour lunch break, unfortunately. What do folks think about that? Whatever you tell us. Better than five minutes. All right, why don't we reconvene at 1.40? Um, sound good? Sounds great. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay, thanks. Thank you.